Over 40. Carl Jones out of boxing for six years, still since resuming his career. He's won five of six, including the WBC Continental America's 168 pound belt. How does this guy fit into the scheme of things? You know, this is his first fight as a light heavyweight. I don't know how well he's going to handle the weight. Never, never mind Mike McCallum, who is a supreme talent. So if he can upset Mike McCallum, he'll give notice that there is a new kid on the block. Otherwise, he is in for one long, terrible night. Well, right now we're set to go ringside to a city that inspired Samuel Johnson in the 18th century to write, when a man is tired of London, he is tired of life. To the London Arena we go, and here's Steve Albert and the fight doctor, Ferdy Pacheco. Thank you, Bruce, and greetings from the London Arena here in the fabled East End on what's known as the Isle of Dogs, about a half hour from central London. We're actually on an island outlined by the River Thames. This is the site of the legendary London Docks, historically one of the roughest areas of all time. It's where Jack the Ripper stalked his unfortunate victims. Why, it's also the birthplace of British boxing, dating all the way back to the bare knuckle days. These days, Docklands, as the area is known, has been transformed into a development spot with upscale hotels, modern office buildings, apartments, restaurants, and of course, the ubiquitous pubs. Yes, the yuppies are taking over the London docks, but tonight, boxing takes over a potentially explosive twin bill headlined by the WBC Super Middleweight Championship. Hello again, everybody. Steve Albert along with the fight doctor, Ferdy Pacheco, and welcome to another overseas edition of Showtime Championship Boxing. We are uh, getting set for hopefully a power-packed card, and the location only adds to the intrigue. And, Ferdy, I know you are psyched. You're geared up for an interesting night. Well, as a history nut, I'm out here looking at this place. This is the burial ground of all the crimes. This is the place they used to put the bodies. The police say there are more bodies buried around here than, than in cemeteries, and, of course, there are going to be bodies here flying in this ring tonight, so I'm excited about the night. All right, we've got two world championship fights upcoming here at the London Arena in London, England. We'll get back to the first one, the WBC Light Heavyweight Championship, momentarily. But first, let's go back to New York and Bruce Beck. Thank you, Steve. While we're on the topic of British boxing, let's take a look at some action of English heavyweight Frank Bruno's last fight against Rodolfo Marin. This fight took place last Saturday at the England Showground Arena in Shepton Mallet in the western part of England. Bruno has had three unsuccessful heavyweight title shots, came into the fight at 37-4 and four with 36 KOs. Marin at 20-3 and three with 16 KOs. Bruno was ranked number nine by the WBC, but unranked by the other sanctioning bodies. Marin, who turned pro in 1986, has never had a world title shot, but has fought and lost to some world-class fighters, including Riddick, Big Daddy Bo. Frank Bruno wants to continue to win impressively since he's on the hit list of possible opponents ready to face Mike Tyson. Well, I'll tell you what, Bruce, everybody now is going to be excited about the big payday possibilities for Mike Tyson. They're going to get some safe opponents, as we see here in Marin, who doesn't have great credentials. They want to look impressive, which we'll see Frank Bruno do in a few minutes. And Mike Tyson is the reason. Bobby, this fight did not last long, only 65 seconds. And in the first round, just 30 seconds in, Bruno was able to drop him. Well, as we're talking about, everybody wants to be a player in the Mike Tyson lottery. Frank Bruno is no different. It's smart. It's good business. It's heavyweight boxing as we know it today. Here comes the first knockdown. You know, we see a right hand that's really kind of glancing, not a big shot. Marin, again, questionable that he should even be in with the caliber of a Frank Bruno. Marin got up at the count of five, but then Bruno continued his attack. You see a big right hand there he just missed. Some bad intentions on that one, although it didn't land. Again, not too much offense offered by Marin questionable opponent. There it is, Bruno knocking down Marin for the second time. Marin counted out by referee John Coyle. Bruno, who lost to Lennox Lewis in October of 1993, came back in March of 94 to KO Jesse Ferguson in the first round. This is his first fight in 1995 after fighting only once in 1994. Well, you know, he's come back with two back-to-back -back knockouts since getting beat in, only in the first round. Here you see... Uh, we have a replay of the first round. It's a glancing at best right hand. But once again, these guys do not want to fight anybody too dangerous because they could lose that big payday with a Mike Tyson. As you watch the second knockdown, Frank knows he has him hurt. He's chasing him backwards. He's using his jab well, trying to back him in a corner. Again, he misses with that big right hand, which he wanted to do damage with. Backs him up still further into the corner. And eventually you'll see him land a little left hook to the side of the head. And you can see that Marin is uh, not too responsive in the way of wanting to stay up and fight back. So it's all Frank Bruno. Frank Bruno. 
You know, the heavyweight division has always been considered boxing's glamour division, and with the expected return of Mike Tyson to the ring, the excitement seems to be back in this weight class. Now, the excitement never really left the heavyweight division, but Mike Tyson is the epitome of excitement as well as the epitome of a heavyweight champion, always taking on all challengers, wanting to remain undisputed at all times. Meanwhile, WBA and IBF heavyweight champion George Foreman is set to face Axel Schultz of Germany in April, but Foreman may be stripped by the WBA for the failure to face number one contender Tony Tucker. Well, you see, George Foreman is a perfect example here with a heavyweight championship with two belts. He is going to fight a safe opponent because he, too, wants to factor in to the Mike Tyson lottery, taking an Axel Schultz, an unheard of, a relative no name. He wants to be in the big picture. Now, yesterday, Evander Holyfield scored a split decision outside of the ring when Nevada boxing officials agreed to lift the former heavyweight champion's medical suspension but failed to endorse Holyfield's plan to fight again. However, Holyfield is free to seek licensing in other states. And, Bobby, what do you make of all of this? Las Vegas Commission is sending a mixed message. They're saying, we're lifting the medical suspension, but we're not going to give you a license. They're definitely sending a mixed message. I don't think they want to be responsible if anything does happen, and they're basically tiptoeing and bowing out of this one. So what do you see happening in the heavyweight division this year? Well, I think you're going to see a uh, number of heavyweights, contenders as well as people with parts of the belt, stay in a safe position to fight Mike Tyson. And by the end of the year, Mike Tyson is wearing at least one of his belts once again. Well, coming up in April, one of the world heavyweight titles will be at stake. WBC champion Oliver McCall makes his first title defense of the crown. He won from Lennox Lewis. That knockout victory five months ago was one of the startling developments that changed the heavyweight picture. April 8th, Showtime event television and King Vision present the WBC heavyweight championship. Newly crowned title holder Oliver McCall versus former champion Larry Holmes. This will be the main event of a world championship quadruple header. Also featured that night, Julio Cesar Chavez, Felix Trinidad, and Terry Norris. See it live on pay-per-view April 8th at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific time. Now we go down in weight from heavyweight to light heavyweight as we focus on Mike McCallum's WBC title defense against Carl Jones. 38-year-old Mike McCallum won his first world title way back in 1984. Few boxers who began their career in that same year are still around. But McCallum, who was only the 17th fighter in history to win three world titles, is a unique champion whose commitment to maintaining body fitness has been as relentless as his savage body attack. McCallum enters his 16th world championship fight tonight against an opponent who was never before contested for a crowd. But don't think for a moment McCallum is taking Carl Jones lightly. He knows there could be danger lurking, especially when the challenger's nickname is 911. He is proficient at every aspect of the game. But no one is better at feeding the body than Mike McCallum. That's the reason why they call me a nickname in the body section. Every time I hit the guy instead of the body, then they, they know what I mean hit by Mike McCallum. Over his 14-year career, McCallum has compiled a 47-2-1 record, won three world titles in three different weight classes, and has, in boxing circles, earned a reputation as a clever technician. I like to set up a shot, and the guy go for it, and I capitalize on it. I feel like... I'm over the moon, you know? Uh, set traps for him to fall into, and he fall into traps. And I feel like, yeah, yeah, Mike, you, you're right, you're doing all right, you know what I mean? You did something, something well accomplished. Last year, McCallum did better than all right when he met rugged Australian Jeff Harding for the WBC light heavyweight title. I have achieved another championship. I'm a three-time champion, and I'm very happy of that and proud, and uh, I move on. And the 38-year-old body snatcher hopes to move on to even greater glory and become the first in 12 years to unify the light heavyweight title. But to do so, he must get by Carl Jones, a challenger with a most unusual boxing resume. Turning pro in 1981, Jones fought for six years, earning a respectable record. I was 17-3, 17 wins, three losses. I think four draws, and I fought Michael Nunn, and I had him down in the first round, and he got up 
and ran from me and beat me in out of decision. Discouraged, he left the ring to hang in the streets for six long years until he walked into a Las Vegas gym and met his future manager. I'm glad I met a guy named Al Rodriguez. If it wasn't for Al Rodriguez, maybe I'd still be on the street. He was a fighter I had seen fight years ago and a very talented young fighter. So I asked him to get up in the ring and just move around a little. He hadn't been in the ring in six years. But after six years, a big fat horse got up in the ring and moved around like a gazelle. So we took him down and signed a new contract and started him back in his career. And since Jones resumed his career, he has won five of his last six fights and earned the unique nickname of 9-1-1. He starts out slow, digs himself a hole sometimes. Now it's an emergency. He has to fight hard. But somehow, somewhere, when it becomes an emergency, it just seems like the other guy goes out on a stretcher. So they chant 9-1-1 when he comes in the arena now. But now, after all his trials and tribulations, as Jones prepares for his most important fight, he promises to surprise the world. Watch out for the 9-1-1 punch. That's all I want him to look for. They'll see that when it happens. Knowing Carl Jones' recent history, Mike McCallum would be best served trying to finish this fight early. That way, he won't have to worry about a Jones comeback, and he doesn't need to concern himself with calling 911. Both McCallum and Jones have recently moved to light heavyweight. Former IBF super middleweight champion James Tony lost earlier this month in his debut as a light heavy. Bobby, are tonight's two combatants legitimate 175 pounders, and will they fare better than Tony did? Well, Tony, as well as Mike McCallum, moved up well on in their years. I think of Father Time and Mother Nature have just packed on a few pounds that they just can't get rid of, and they can't fight any at any lesser weights. Well, as far as Jones, 168 pounds, first fight as a light heavyweight against the Mike McCallum. I don't think he's a legitimate light heavyweight, but the other two guys are, and I think Mike McCallum's already fared better than James Tony. <laughs> Can McCallum smother Jones with his blistering body blows? McCallum's been fighting for so long, he's smothered so many fighters and good fighters. When he is on, he can smother any fighter with that body shot attack that he has. If he does it here, we could have an early night. Jones is a Cinderella story, so how much stock do you put in that when you consider his chances tonight? I think even Cinderella had better odds than he may have here today. <laughs> his resume is not very significant, and I'll tell you what, he, he's got his work cut out for him against one of the premier talents in the business. But Jones is a guy who just might believe in himself a little bit more right now and might believe that someone up there will help him get over the hump. Bruce, when two men enter that square ring, only one usually leaves the victor. Anything can happen in one hour of one day. A man can rise to the occasion, and another can falter. Now, they did spar together a number of years ago. Could in any way that figure into the scheme of things tonight? They both may have a feel for one another from sparring. Sparring's a little different, bigger gloves big headgear on, and, and it's a different sort of atmosphere. The pressure's not on, a world championship is not at stake. I don't think it'll help or hurt either of the fighters here today, but certainly Mike McCallum on paper is the talent. You talked about father time earlier. What about McCallum? I mean, do you think his body is changing, or do you think this guy is a very unusual success story? I think he's an unusual success story, but I will tell you what. Every once in a while when a man, especially in boxing, gets older, he just wakes up one day and it's gone. For Mike, I hope that's not his case today. What about foreign soil and how that might play into things? Sometimes the travel and the, the time, the warp there for some guys, they don't adjust as well. Both of them are making the travel. No one's at home in the foreign land, so equally advantage or disadvantage doesn't matter. So we are closing in on this WBC light heavyweight title fight between the body snatcher Mike McCallum and 911 Carl Jones. And although these two fighters have traveled very different paths to get to this encounter, they both know each other very well. We actually worked together in the gym at one stage of our career. Um, he's a good fighter, damn good fighter. Yeah. I know I'm stronger than him, so that's no problem with it. But I know he's smart and he's a technician, so I had to be smart too. And, and, and make him use his legs and push him back. I'm sure you've been waiting a long time, like most other fighters. And uh, it's an opportunity that uh, come to him that he wanted all along. I dreamed about this fight two years ago, and I think now is the perfect time better than two years ago. <laughs> I kind of like my title. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ready to give it up. So, uh, again, I'm, I'm going to beat him down.
Here is the tell of the tape for this WBC light heavyweight championship schedule for 12 rounds. McCallum is clearly the elder statesman, six years older than Jones at age 38. Jones is a quarter inch taller and three pounds lighter. McCallum has a three and a half inch reach advantage. Here are the rules of the World Boxing Council, which will govern tonight's fight. There is a 10 point must scoring system. Three judges will score the fight. The referee does not. There is no standing eight count, no three knockdown rule. Only the referee can stop the fight and a fighter cannot be saved by the bell except in the last round. Right now, we're set to go back to London Arena, which opened in 1988 and is built on the site of the old London Docklands. Let's rejoin Steve Albert and Ferdy Pacheco. All right, thank you again, Bruce, and welcome back to the London Arena. A sellout crowd of about 11,000 is expected as we close in on the first of two world title fights. The WBC Light Heavyweight Championship featuring three-time world champion Mike the Body Snatcher McCallum versus Carl Jones. Hello again, everybody. Steve Albert, along with the fight doctor, Ferdy Pacheco. And uh, the guys back in New York touched on it, but uh, about two and a half years ago, John's, uh, Jones did have the opportunity to spar with McCallum. Will that be of any benefit to Jones tonight? None whatsoever, if he could remember it. <laughs> and, and he can't remember it. And talking to him yesterday, Jones said, I didn't even know I was in this world. I mean, I went through the motions. My body was there, but my mind wasn't there. I said, that's pretty hard stuff. You want me to say that? He said, yes, that's the way it was. And McCallum said, really, he was just a body to be punched. He, he couldn't have learned anything. So well, he didn't. We all know that Mike McCallum is an excellent ring technician. He has great punching power. What does Jones have to do to try and neutralize the veteran McCallum? Well, he'd have to get inside. He'd have to try to force the action inside, take away this wonderful jab and body attack. Uh, but unfortunately, in talking to him in his corner, Jones, Jones says, I'm going to wait to see what he's doing. I'm going to lay back and see how he's coming in. Well, if he lays back with McCallum, He's in for the major pounding of his life because he will come in. McCallum will come in with that stiff jab that's so wonderful, but all that does is raise the hands of the other guy that's trying to block it, leaving the body open to that magnificent attack, and that is a sledgehammer attack that Mike McCallum has. He is indeed the body snatcher. And despite his advancing years, at least in terms of the sport of boxing, McCallum just marches on. What makes Michael run? What keeps McCallum going? I think it's ego. I mean, and nothing... Nothing could set that better than this little vignette that happened to us in the lobby yesterday. He came in the first time you see me. I heard what you and Steve said about my weight. I, I heard that you said we had a spare tire, and I did. And this time, I'm down to wait to show you guys that I'm perfect. Wait till you see me walk in. And right there, he took off his shirt, and he showed me he had no roll of fat, no everything. I said, man, that's, I mean, we didn't want to inspire you that much. And he, he said, well... I want to be the best. I want to go down in history as the best. And I don't want anything to be wrong or different with me. So here's a man that's driven by ego. He wants his place in history. And for my money, he's earning it. And of course, he has the vast world championship experience, whereas his opponent tonight, Carl Jones, the unheralded Carl Jones, does not. This has to work in as a major factor as well. Oh, absolutely. And when, when you have a guy of the quality of McCallum with his confidence, with having been tested by the best, it's a huge, huge, huge advantage over a guy who hasn't. And Mike McCallum told us uh, at the weigh-in yesterday that the key weapon, as far as he is concerned, will be the jab. Well, the problem is how does Jones offset such a key weapon? That's the problem, because if he tries to block it, he leaves the body open. He has to duck under it. He has to go inside. He has to fight tight inside to the body of McCallum also. But he can't do that. McCallum's too smart. He's got great legs. Even at that age, he dances away and resets, dances away and resets. I tell you, Jones is in for a very tough night, and I would be surprised if he gives McCallum a hard time tonight. Well, at the press conference earlier this week, uh, somebody asked Mike McCallum, Mike, how old are you really? And McCallum responded by saying, 52, 62, what's the difference? <laughs> he may make it to the, the way the boxes are going these days. McCallum may make it to 52. Uh, I, it's absolutely ridiculous, by the way. I'm, I'm not in favor of old fighters fighting, as you know. All right, we're getting ready for the WBC Light Heavyweight Championship from London Arena for an interesting sidelight. Let's return to our control center in New York in Bruce Beck. Steve, when Carl Jones gave up boxing in July of 1987, he drifted to Las Vegas and fell on hard times. Meanwhile, back in Los Angeles, his son, Carl Jones Jr., was put in a foster home after the mother relinquished custody of the child. Jones, down and out and unemployed at the time, was not thought to be a suitable father. But since that time, he has resumed his boxing career and gotten his life back on track, and he desperately wants to be reunited with his son. 
He hopes a victory tonight, a world championship belt, will influence the court to rule favorably and give him custody of his son. Certainly added incentive tonight for Carl Jones. Back to you, Steve. It's fight time. Welcome back to the London Arena. As we look at the challenger, 32-year-old Carl Jones out of Los Angeles, California, now lives in Las Vegas. Jones 22, 4 and 4, 12 knockouts, going for his first world title up until tonight. His most important fight was back in May of 94 when he came from behind to win the WBC Continental Americas Championship. Veteran Carl Jones making his way into the ring. He got off to a rather rocky 1-1-1 one, one one start in his pro career, but uh, then went undefeated his next 18, which earned him a fight with Michael Nunn back in 86. After flooring Nunn of the first, Jones unable to finish him off and ended up losing by decision. That defeat really devastated devastated Jones who slipped to an obscure six-year absence from the sport of boxing but uh, he has since pulled himself together from the depths of unemployment and resurrected his career the belt you see is the WBC Continental Americas championship belt won by uh, Carl Jones Jones uh, told us he intends to take his time tonight be patient be smart stay busy keep McCallum going back try to wear him down and take away his jab. The jab may have been the key, as we mentioned before, because afterwards in talking to the body snatcher, he told us that the jab will be his main weapon, just as it was in his victory over Randall Yonker two fights ago. And now we are set for the ring walk of the champion. You hear the crowd coming alive. Mike the Body Snatcher McCallum will make his way in, listed as 38, but maybe actually closer to 40. A wealth of world championship experience. His 16th world title fight, 12 2 and 1 in championship bouts. McCallum has quietly but effectively become one of the true elder statesmen of boxing, always an engaging and personable man. Gets a genuine kick out of his elder statesman status as he's doing this for the older generation. Born in Kingston, Jamaica. As you hear the reggae music in the background leading him in, makes his home in the Flatbush section of Brooklyn, New York. 47 2 and 1. 35 knockouts. His only losses to Sumbo Columbe in 88, which he later avenged James Tony in 92. He also fought Tony to a draw back in 91. So here comes Mike McCallum just off to our left, climbing the steps. Takes a big deep breath and makes his way through the ropes. out in a lovely red outfit good crowd on hand here at the london arena three-time world champion mike mccallum fighting pro since 1981 14 years the former wba junior middleweight champ wba middleweight champ tonight his first defense of the wbc light heavyweight championship we're standing by for the classy jimmy lennon jr and the introductions Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you, and we welcome you to the first of our world title main events brought to you by Frank Warren Sports Network, along with Don King Productions, and sponsored by Acclaim Entertainment. This bout is sanctioned by the World Boxing Council President Jose Suleiman, Supervisor John Morris, along with the British Boxing Board of Control, the steward in charge, Nipper Reed. Introducing to you the judges for this bout, Chuck Jumpa, John Keane, and Mickey Van. Introducing to you the referee in charge, Larry O'Connell. All right, fans, here we go with the WBC Light Heavyweight Championship of the World scheduled for 12 rounds of boxing. Introducing to you first the challenger on my left, fighting out of the red corner. He is wearing black trunks with white trim, fighting out of Las Vegas, Nevada, by way of Los Angeles, California, in the United States. He weighed in at 12 stone, 3 pounds, 171 U.S. pounds. His record includes 22 wins, 4 losses, 
four draws with 12 wins coming by way of knockout. And here is the WBC Continental Americas Super Middleweight Champion. Please welcome the challenger, Carl 911 Jones. His opponent across the ring on my right is the defending champion fighting out of the blue corner wearing red trunks with white trim fighting out of brooklyn new york by way of kingston jamaica his weight 12 stone six pounds 174 u.s pounds his record 47 wins two losses one draw with 35 wins coming by way of knockout Please welcome the three-time world champion tonight making the first defense of his most current title. Here is the WBC light heavyweight champion of the world, introducing Mike, the body snatcher, Mike Howard. Once again, here's your referee in charge now to give instructions, Larry O'Connell. Mike? Had you had your instructions in, in the dressing rooms, I expect it to be a good, clean fight. I made the best man win. Good luck to both of you. Well, the crowd is really up for this fight, and they are clearly behind the champion, Mike McAdam. There's McAdam. Very steady, quality fighter. Hedgeman Lewis, the former welterweight contender, will be marking out signals as his head trainer. And we are set to go. Round one, scheduled for 12 for the WBC Light Heavyweight Championship. Larry O'Connell of London, England, is the third man of the ring. McCallum in the all red trunks, Jones in the black trunks with the white trim. McCallum wasting no time with that strong jab. He came out, put one to the stomach and one to the head, landed both of them, and then followed with a hook. He's not wasting time. You won't get flash from McCallum. Great experience, excellent ring technician. His trademark, the resounding body shots, thus the nickname, the body snatcher, given to him while sparring with Tommy Hearns. Look at the ease with which he lands jabs to the stomach. That's a dangerous punch. I mean, guys get knocked out from throwing that, and he throws it like it's nothing. I mean, it's, it's, and it lands with force. He can take the steam out of his opponent, inflicting severe punishment. He is a crisp puncher. There's that jab he told us about. He's gonna use it a lot. Carl Jones looks a little stiff, a little intimidated. Oh, nice hard hook by McCallum. A little stiff, no motion. His legs look dead. Oh, nice right hand by Carl Jones. Carl Jones, who describes himself as a boxer puncher, as most fighters do, but added to us, lately I've been dragging my right foot and doing more straight brawling. He calls his left hook his best weapon, but he's been working on the right hand as well. Well, Carl Jones gets off the best punch so far. Yeah, that was a strong, strong punch. But again, McCallum was leaning away from it when he uh, when he threw it. So, you know, this guy is so clever. You, you can't discount the uh, defensive brilliance of Mike McCallum. He is so good with his jab to the midsection. He does it almost casually, but effectively. He's a very calm yet busy fighter and has no mercy. That is the book on McCallum. Carl is punching very hard, trying to hope to get lucky in this first round. As mentioned before, when he sparred with McCallum two and a half years ago, he told us he didn't learn anything from that experience because he said he was there in body only, not in mind. Well, he's had all kinds of problems. He's straightened himself out this far to get here and challenge for the titles. You have to admire Carl Jones. He's workmanlike. He's uh, gotten rid of a bad, few bad habits, and here he is, so you got to admire him. Yes, he has turned his life around after being destitute, unemployed. He's trying to get his son back, as uh, Bruce Beck chronicled uh, back in New York. Less than 30 seconds remaining in the round. Just keep your eye on that jab. This is the way a jab should work. For all you guys that want to learn boxing, try to copy Mike McCallum. There's a jab to the stomach. There's a jab up above. There's a right hand under the heart. I mean, the guy just relentless. So time winding down on the opening round here at the London Arena. Mike McCallum in his first defense of the title. 
And no problem there. Mike McCallum wins it handily, uh, although one of the best punches of that round was by Carl Jones. And Bertie, as we say every time we cross the big pond here into England, they aren't allowed to mic the corner, so we'll have to read lips. I think the, the lips we'll read is on McCallum's corner, where Hedgeman Lewis, who is, by the way, this is his birthday. This is the birthday of Hedgeman Lewis. And all you guys at home try to guess his age, you'll miss it by 10 years. The young looking guy. The question is, who's older, Hedgeman Lewis or Mike McCallum? That's what I told him. I said, you keep on going. These guys are going to pass you. That's why McCallum used uh, Eddie Futch for all those years. You couldn't tell who was older. <laughs> you couldn't get there. Here's Wal well, Jones. They can't say much to this guy, except you're doing all right. Just try to keep landing that one punch. Mario Macias is the trainer. He also uses Roger Mayweather and Cornelius Boza Edwards. Now, there is a really fine fighter. Cornelius Boza Edwards gave it all he had every time. Mayweather is a very, very good fighter also, but Boza Edwards, there wasn't a fight you went to one of his fights that, that didn't turn out to be a brawl. He was great. Jones unrated in this division. His first world title shot, he's in the Black Trunks round two. He won the WBC Continental America's crown in May of 94. After 10 close rounds against Southpaw Kevin Fullerton, Jones suffered a flash knockdown of the 11th, needed at least a knockdown of the 12th to win, and he got it. He's going to have to try to counter these jabs. He's got to do something to stop him. He can't block him. He better start countering. Go to the body, get inside, do something, because he's standing out here. He is right in McCallum territory. That's where he wants. Jones with the jab is a right hand by McCallum, guarded well by Jones. Even at this age, the reflexes are amazing on Mike McCallum. Really, at this age, he should have slowed down. I think it's that Brooklyn air myself. He lives well, and, and he, he is dedicated to becoming part of history. He really is. He wants to be part of boxing history, considered a great champion. At he's this rate, he'll make it. Yeah, he's on the way in my book. As mentioned, he got the nickname the body snatcher from Tommy Hearns. He never actually fought. Uh, Tommy Hearns or Roberto Duran, and perhaps they were smart in staying away from McCallum. That would have been beautiful matches, but McCallum's only problem in, in, in boxing has been managerial. He just kept, he just couldn't get, get himself together. He kept getting rid of managers. That was bad on his part, but he's on track now. Midway through round two, scheduled for 12. It's been pretty close to this point. McCallum having a little bit of an edge. And uh, we should note, you and I, that he has no love handles. Oh, nice well, right hand. Now he's got a big edge. McCallum with a huge right hand. Now going to the body end of the head. And here's that relentless attack that we talked about. Let's see if Jones can stay away. Blood coming from the nostrils of Jones. Remember, we're in England. They will oh, stop a fight here. A left hook by Mike McCallum, followed by uppercuts. A barrage by McCallum as the crowd really gets into it. Oh, is he a killer or what? He just he just picks this guy apart. He's not throwing anything uh, useless here. Everything counts. What a what an attack by Mike McCallum. A blistering attack. McCallum like a shark. He sees the blood and goes in for it. He hit him a hook, an uppercut, another hook from the other side. I mean, they're raining blows from all all angles. As the lights go up, less than 30 seconds remaining in round two. Jones looks very stunned, very stunned indeed. As we head for the bell, final second. Jones misses with a wild left. Very dangerous against a fighter like McCallum. What a one-way beating that one. And still, Jones has an edge of, of, of uh, fierceness to him. He comes back with a couple of comments, but he misses because he is so completely bewildered by this attack, he can't possibly mount an attack. The best thing we can say about the challenger, Kyle Jones, right now, showing a lot of heart. Well, heart won't get you much place in London because they will stop you. They have uh, great uh, medical teams here. And uh, let's take a look at that. The, the right hand did, did the damage, no question, but before that, there was that... There you go. There was that waterfall of punches that hit him, uh, of jabs. I mean, it just it's incredible, the attack, how varied, how strong he is. Carl Jones living up to form, and he's getting himself into emergency conditions. His nickname is 911. Also, he is called the Arrow, but in that last round, he was more of the target.
than anything else. Round three scheduled for 12. Let's see how Jones responds. Not much you could say to him in the corner. I mean, he, he just he's up against a guy that's got much faster reflexes and is a, a much better superior boxer. That's all you can say. Maybe he'll get lucky. Maybe he can land something real strong and turn this around. That's the only chance he's got. Well, from what I've seen, you got to fight McCallum from the angles. You cannot stand right in front of him. You're asking for trouble. Absolutely standing in front of a cannon. You must give him angles or try to get under and try to get inside and try to get him confused and so forth. But, boy, you stand in front of him. That's target practice. And that is exactly the case here for Mike McCallum, who comes off a very, very good round, round two. He unleashed many, many punches, and most of them connected. And now again, working the jab to the head of Carl Jones, the champion McCallum in the red trunks. And another factor of McCallum is he's rather tireless. I mean, once you watch him fight like this, he goes like this all 12 rounds. I mean, you know, every once in a while he came in not in good shape, and he looked like he got tired around 8 or 9, but he kept right on going to 12. And as you mentioned, he looked a bit on the flabby side in his uh, last fight. But after watching it on television, he realized he better take some of that weight off, and he looks in tip-top condition here. He certainly does. Eight has not bothered him at all. Good right hand. Okay. Overhand right, right on the target. Thumping punch by McCallum, and the crowd response. McCallum off the unanimous decision over Australian Jeff Harding for the title in July at Bismarck, North Dakota. Midway through round three. A thumping body shot by each guy. I mean... When McCallum landed one, the other guy threw one just as good. So that's the first time he's been hit that hard to the body as McCallum. Jones throwing some more body stuff. That's what he's got to do. Throw that body stuff and get in close. Left and a right, right to the head. Two jabs and another right. Another jab. I mean, this guy is relentless. McCallum nailing Jones, flush on the face. But fortunately for the challenger, those didn't have that much steam behind them. Well, that's what he does so well. He pops, 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 and all of a sudden he loads up on the right. I mean, any great fighter does that. Sugar Ray Robinson on down. That's what they do. You lull him with that little jab, and then all of a sudden, bombs drop. And Mike McCallum is doing that right now, orchestrating the attack against Carl Jones. He is in complete control. Nice head movement by McCallum. Well, if Jones has anything left on those punches, that's the only thing that could keep McCallum off right now. He's just getting a beating. McCallum, 47, 2 and 1 with 35 knockouts. Only losses, Sumbo Kalambe and James Tony. His first defense of the title. Left hook by McCallum, then the combination. And Jones just stands in front and eats it. As the bell sounds to end round three. Appreciative applause from the sophisticated crowd here in London, England. As we go into the corner, top side of the champion, Mike McCallum. Hedgeman Lewis working the corner. Bell Torrance is the cut man. Hedgeman's going to have to start worrying about whether he's going to have to stop this in a while because right now, if this continues on for several rounds, it's just a one-way beating. Let's take a look at the replay in which you see that there's just almost nothing. Look, there's the right hand right, right on the very high. Even though he had his glove there, he still got hit on the top of the head. He had the glove in position to block it, but McCallum aimed above the glove. I mean, and the body shots were thumping in that, in that thing. It, these hooks that land right under the elbow, just at the tip of the liver, take it right out of you. I mean, it's, it's an awful punch. Second up, round four. As we close in on round four, it has been all Mike McCallum to this point. You know, every once in a while you watch boxing for months and months and months and maybe even a year, and then all of a sudden a thing like the Foreman fight happens, and it changes everybody's thinking. Everybody says, yeah, but only one punch can change it. You know, yeah, but you got to land it, and you got to have the force of Foreman uh, to land it, and you got to want to get hit like uh, the champion did, unfortunately. Yes, Michael Moore. <laughs> yeah, Michael Moore, who looked like he had a T-shirt written, please take my title. <laughs> well, Mike McCallum is all over Carl Jones. No T-shirt like that here in London. No, his T-shirt says, give me your body, and I will hand you back ashes. And also on the back it says, fountain of youth. <laughs> Carl Jones, 22-4-4 four four with 12 knockouts. Out of Los Angeles, 
Comes off a TKO round seven over a fighter named Laurie Gross, November of 1994 in Reno. Oh, another right hand and a left uppercut. Another left uppercut. Those uppercuts are doing some damage. And he, uh, he has oh, Jones backpedaling into the ropes and whistles one into the midsection. Mike McCallum again canvassing Jones. One on each side. One good body shot on each side just to balance things up. About a minute 30 left in round number four. It has been a systematic approach here to Mike McCallum just taking Jones apart. Boy, you got to give Jones credit. He's hanging in there, and when he, and he puts punches in, he's got a lot of power to him, but they're just not landing. That a great uh, deal due to the defensive genius of Mike McCallum. Jones devastated several years ago by his loss to uh, Michael Nunn. There's a big right hand by Mike McCallum, uppercut by McCallum, once again smothering Carl Jones. Get the punches up, the warning from Larry O'Connell. And Mike is used to that, because when you punch to the body, that's what you get told a lot during the, during the night. That's the first time he's, he's been told tonight. There's that jab once again, doubling and tripling up by McCallum, setting up the right hand, but fortunately for Jones, a glancing blow. That one connected better. Every once in a while, you can see McCallum really step on the gas. Like he's trying for the knockout, he doesn't get it. He goes back to bipping and bopping, then he comes back again and turns it on. And as usual, we are seeing just about everything from the McCallum repertoire. Oh, a shot to the midsection, and Jones goes down. That's never been shown any better than that, what a body shot can do. That was pure body shot. That was pure body shot, and your legs say, no more, please. And the bell sounds. It happened with 250 remaining. Uh, 250 into the round and only 10 seconds remaining in round number four. Now that was a prime example. That body shot of the year <laughs> might be of the decade. I never saw something that pure knock somebody down. A nice little uppercut right to the body and knocked him out. Knocked him down, I'm sorry. The legs block room. Everything stops below your waist. It's like the central nervous system says, we're out to lunch for a few minutes here. Let us get back together. Now, let's watch this. Keep your eye. Keep your eye on McCallum. There it is. Just the right, starting into, turning into an uppercut and lands. Actually, it looks a little low on top of it. Let's, let's look at it from around the view and let's see. Yeah, it looked a little right at belt level. You know, right at that band. And just seconds earlier, he had been warned by the referee for low blows. There it is. You can't see it from that angle. But the previous angle, I think you're right. Yeah. Wow. Now, the first and only knockdown of the fight provided by Mike McCallum with 10 seconds remaining in the fourth round as Carl Jones continues to be punished. Round five underway. And the other thing that's happening to the hapless Jones is his face is uh, beginning to lump up. His eyes are beginning to close, especially the left eye is beginning to close up. And where he hurts the most, you don't see any lumps, and that's his body. You don't see the lumps. Those are inside. Well, once again, Carl Jones in a come-from-behind situation. Only this time, the man in front of him is the quality Mike McCallum. He's never fought anybody like this before. <laughs> Again to the midsection, almost a low blow. McCallum unleashes a hard left hook. Working the jab, hitting him with the right. Everything. McCallum looks like he wants to finish this night. The last round, he was really trying in spurts to put him out. This time, it looks like his corner said, okay, let's get out of here. This is enough of this. Jones may have underestimated Mike McCallum. He thought McCallum was over the hill, feeling that perhaps he couldn't put people away anymore. He might be thinking differently right now. Is that called whistling in the dark? Yes. Oh, what a right hand by McCallum, followed by a combination uppercut. And again, McCallum goes to work. Beautiful fainting, too, by McCallum. It looks like he's going downstairs, and then he opens up his gloves, and he goes right through the middle. It's incredible what he does. I mean, he truly is an incredible fighting machine. He just fakes you, faints you. He goes one way, goes the other, and he throws a punch, and uppercut lands. He's just a thing of beauty right now. You're watching a master at work. That's all I can say. You know? open mouth admiration of this guy's performance. Jones tried to answer, but you can also see the, uh, the good chin on McCallum. Didn't even flinch. 
Beautiful jab again by McCallum. A and work of art. What you can, what you're seeing here is, is great work by a great champion against a great journeyman who is just not in his class. Uh, he is just being totally out, maneuvered out class. Good left hand there by Jones that sends McCallum back just a hair. This is one way, but every once in a while you get the hope, you know, you get Ooh. the thought. Look, a nice right, right hand by Jones, and he throws it hard. It's not like he's got not got the punch anymore. It has been one and done though for Jones. He doesn't follow up with it. Now he seems to be so surprised when it lands. Yes. He's been hitting air all night long. Then he, he then he takes a step back, less than 30 seconds remaining in the fifth round. That's World what, Championship fight. That's what the old cornermen say. You hit him once and you step back to look at your pretty work. Don't do that. Keep on coming. Don't admire your work. Keep on coming. And that's what McCallum does. McCallum knows only one direction, that is forward. He continues to advance on the challenger, Carl Jones. Final seconds, and there's your bell. Round five in the books. How would you like to be Jones's cornerman? How'd you like to be Hedgeman Lewis? Saying to the guy, here, I got a new idea. Why don't you try to hit him on the chin? You know, Hedgeman Lewis is a number one contender at one time. And uh, he fought um, Matakianopoulos one night in Mexico City. I was in Napolis corner. Ryan O'Neill brought his little daughter Tatum, who loved this uh, Hedgeman, and he got destroyed. She never watched boxing again, went into tennis, and we know how that turned out. Yes, yes. O'Neill managed, managed uh, Hedgeman, right? O'Neill managed right. him. He loved Hedgeman Lewis. He was, he was a good fighter, good contender. Let's look at the handiwork of McCallum. Left jab right on the nose. Now, those hurt. It's right on the nose, and it sets you up another left jab another one you see three jabs in a row it's incredible that they all landed with force and now here comes Jones back with one good right hand but as you said he stops and he looks and he says hey wasn't that pretty and he doesn't fight anymore all right pretty round six in round five a very game Carl Jones kept throwing punches unfortunately he was taking even more he was knocked down late in the uh, fourth round a great shot to the midsection and he went down uh, like a thud. So now round six. It has been all Mike McCallum. Mike McCallum in his first title defense. The WBC light heavyweight championship. Which he won from Aussie Jeff Harding back in July in North Dakota. It is the first ever world title shot. For Carl Jones. That is a powerful left jab, not a probing left jab. That one had meaning. And he caught him flat-footed. He caught Jones flat-footed so that it was more power to it yet. He didn't even give with it. He just got shocked back by it. A wide left hook by Carl Jones. That's dangerous. Leaves himself open. Look at this. Look how many times the jab lands. I mean, that's almost inhuman. A one-sided affair. But again, we, we reiterate a game. Carl Jones hanging tough. But taking a lot of punishment. Now you think of guys in boxing whose jab control people. Sonny Liston almost knocked people out with a jab. Ali certainly. Louis Rodriguez certainly. Larry Sugar Ray Robbins certainly. Larry Holmes kept the championship going on a jab. And maybe the hardest jab Joe Lewis would kill you with this jab. So you're looking at, at a weapon that's really necessary if you're going to be a great champion. Jones missing with that left. They just clunked bodies. Again, there is that jab by Mike McCallum. McCallum nope. looks to be in exquisite condition. It's just the legs are dead on, uh, on Jones. Have been since the first round. He just, he just doesn't know how to move. He has, stands parallel with his legs parallel, uh, meaning that if you get hit, you really get the full power instead of uh, being able to rock back and forth. Plus, he's got some kind of bandage on his knee. That's always depressing to see a guy with bandages on him when he comes to fight for the title. Yes. About the only chance he's got here is that Mike McCallum gets bored. And and that ain't gonna happen. Now he's gone too far. They say he's closer to 40, listed at 38. Mike McCallum, less than 30 seconds remaining in round number six, scheduled for 12. Again, Jones being backed up by the left jab, the stiff jab of Mike McCallum. McCallum's holding back the right for the moment. Continuing with the jab. There's the right, but it was blocked by the glove of Jones. Now combination to the head by McCallum, working the head. He's hitting him like the light bag, like you hit the light bag. 
I mean, it, it looks like what Bobby Chez does to the light bag in the gym. So round six is history. Let's get some comments from our New York studio, Bruce Beck and Bobby Chez. Bruce? Well, Steve, before the fight, we talked about proficient in all aspects of the game, Mike McCallum, and that's uh, been very much confirmed thus far. Yeah, he is he's the consummate workman. Right now, Cinderella's getting whipped by the wicked stepfather. What about the fact that he's doubling and tripling up in the jab? He's doing everything he wants to. He has good reach for his size. He has a three-inch reach, even though they're the same height. He's actually a quarter of an inch shorter. Excellent reach. He uses it well. He steps to his opponent, lands clean waists, no motion. Jones, 9-1-1, always gets in trouble, always comes back, but uh, he might be in too deep right now, huh? I think tonight he's going to not be able to dial it, so I'm going to have to call for him. <laughs> Quick question. Can McCallum put him away? I mean, we're about the one-punch knockout power. Not one punch, but he'll be gone. All right, let's go back to Steve and Ferdy at the London Arena. All right, thank you very much, Bruce. It is round seven here in the East End of London. Mike McCallum has had his way. He has knocked Jones down once. That was late in the fourth round. And knocked him down with a body punch. If anybody is uh, just joining us, a beautiful body punch to the midsection right at belt level. Took the legs out from under Jones and down he went. Every round has been controlled by Mike McCallum, who is clearly throwing a shutout. But you got to believe he is looking to put this man away once and for all. A little bit of a low blow there by McCallum, but uh, overlooked by Larry O'Connell, who warned him a couple of rounds ago. Now he goes upstairs again. Flush on the face. Oh, a combination by McCallum. Now uppercuts, but Jones continues to stand. Oh. Another combination by McCallum to the face of Carl Jones. Hard right hand by McCallum. That's and now O'Connell steps in. He steps in, and it is all over. Yeah, that's what happens in England. They have a very, very merciful system of boxing. It was evident that he was doing nothing but getting hit. And this saves the boxes for later on. Also here in England, the greatest equipment you've ever seen is right in the hallway next to me, a stretcher with full medical equipment so we wouldn't have things that like happen in Mexico right. City. Much to, to the commendation of London and the British Boxing Council. We remember what happened with Terry Norris and Luis Santana. Disgraceful. In any event, uh, Mr. Jones was just not fighting back, not responding. And so they stopped the fight. Again, here is the punishment being inflicted by the champion, Mike McKellar. And correctly stopped. There's no reason for this. I mean, there are people who want to see 12 rounds of this. Well, I don't. There's no way that Jones has any chance here, none whatsoever. And uh, so, therefore, it keeps him fighting again. It keeps him going on. I mean, this guy is trying to make a living for himself in boxing. He's had a tough time in life. He can come back off this and continue to fight. There's nothing wrong with his performance here. It's just that he's in above his head. It's a good journeyman against a great champion. TKO round seven for Mike McCallum. As we take another look, look at these angles he comes from, from everywhere. Now, the way he handles the uppercut, it's so surprising. You just don't think it's coming, and all of a sudden, it's taking your head back. He let an uppercut right there. He missed with that one, but boy, he's been hitting him with every kind of uppercut. Those right hands were gonging him. It's just no reason. No reason. And uh, thus, Larry O'Connell, the referee from London, England, steps in and says, Carl, you've had enough. You're just not answering back. And that was the case almost every round. There comes O'Connell waving it off. And it's another victory for Mike McCallum, who goes to 48-2-1 with 36 knockouts and uh, defends his WBC, a light heavyweight championship, for the first time. Blowing kisses to the crowd. The crowd uh, in favor of McCallum as soon as his face appeared on the way to the ring earlier. They love him. And yes, whether he's 52 or 62, what's the difference? One of the most engaging and personable guys you'll ever find in the sport. And that sort of carries over that personality into the crowd. The crowd appreciates the efforts and the personality of Mike McCallum. So we're standing by to throw it over to uh, Jimmy Lennon Jr. for the official time. Let's go up to Jimmy Lennon Jr. Ladies 
and gentlemen, we have the time of one minute, 17 seconds in round number seven. The referee in charge, Larry O'Connell, stops the contest. The winner by way of technical knockout and still champion, Mike the Body Snatcher, McCallum. So there you have it, Mike McCallum rolls on as he goes to 48, 2 and 1 with 36 knockouts. Mike McCallum, three-time world champion, defends his championship against Carl Jones, another quality performance, but against a uh, pretty, without question, a journeyman fighter. Gave all he could, but he's just not in the same class as McCallum. And another thing, when a guy leaves the ring for six years, very, very seldom does he come back to any meaningful encounters because he just left everything out there. It's going to, in the same token, it's going to be hard for Mike Tyson to come back because he's got to get his body used to the punishment. And that takes time. So, you know, Ali did it in three years. Tyson can do it in three, but six is too long. All right, so Mike McCallum making the excursion from his home in Brooklyn, New York. There you see Carl Jones, who drops to 22, 5, and 4. But a trip well worth it for Mike McCallum as he defeats Carl Jones. So there you have it here at the London Arena in London, England. We'll return to ringside in a short while with post-fight interviews. But for now, let's go back across the big pond to our control center in New York and Bruce Beck. Thank you, Steve. So for the 15th consecutive year, Mike McCallum has at least one victory. Chappie, and boy, did he look sharp. Yeah, he was picture perfect textbook. He did everything, head and body, he wasted no motion. He was sharp. He used the jab. He worked behind the jab, through the hooks, the counter punches. He did it all. You talk about the word efficiency, he certainly was efficient. Uh, he was perfect. He didn't waste any motion. He didn't waste any energy. He didn't run around and do anything silly. He set up his punches, got to the point, didn't throw everything on all of his punches, loaded up when he needed to. Consummate workman. Did Carl Jones show you a decent chin? He got hit with some very clean punches, showed a decent heart and a decent chin, but uh, just doesn't have the tools to deal with a Mike McCallum. Let's go back to some of the highlights in this fight. First of all, the second round, McCallum with a huge right, and he kind of got it things uh, rolling along pretty good there, Bobby. Well, Mike can do whatever he wants. In the second round, you'll see when they roll the tape that whatever Carl Jones did got countered. When he didn't lead, McCallum led there. You see the counter right hand. No matter what Carl, jo Carl Jones did, Mike McCallum had the answers and delivered. In the fourth round, it was that big body blow. You know, it looked a little bit low, but it was right in the gut, right in the belly, just below the solar plexus, a good shot again, the body snatcher. And then he stopped it in the seventh, the referee did, because there was just uh, one-sided domination. Not only was it just a one-sided fight, but there was serious punishment about to really take place, and there was no need for it. Carl Jones did what he could, didn't win any portion of any round. The referee did the right thing, spared him, let him uh, live to fight another day. So Mike McCallum now with 48 wins. He has fought in 16 championship fights, and experience was clearly one-sided, and Mike McCallum used that experience in the ring. He has all that experience because he's good enough to keep coming back time and time again and win. Mike McCallum is the goods. Well, standing by for interviews in London, Steve Albert and Ferdy Pacheco at the London Arena, so let's go back to Steve and Ferdy right now. All right, thank you very much, Bruce, and welcome back to the London Arena here in London, England, where just moments ago, Mike... McCallum lived up to his nickname as the Body Snatcher, retaining his WBC Light Heavyweight Championship with a seventh round technical knockout over a former sparring partner, Carl Jones. And right now we are set for post-fight reaction. The fight doctor, Ferdy Pacheco, is alongside the champion. This is what you call a boxing lesson. Did, did you think you were going to put on such an exhibition of fine boxing as you did tonight? Well, I'm glad that people all around the world see. First of all, I must say, Virgil, I know you're watching. Come on with it, baby. You and Bill, stop hiding behind Bill. I'm talking about the mayor. And bring it on, Virgil. I know you're watching me. Next time, be sweeter. But you know something, baby? Stop hiding. Stop running all over the place. Let's right. fight, baby. Let's, Come on, let's get in the let's, ring. Let's let King get into that, Don King, get into that. <laughs> let's talk boxing, you and I. Have you ever knocked down a guy with just one body shot like you did just then? That's show you I'm getting better. Let's see, I'm an old man. I'm fighting with the senior citizens. They'll show you that age is just a number. 
and knocked him down with a body shot. But he's never been knocked down before with a body shot. I don't think he's been knocked down before no. with a body shot. I, 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 I never saw it. one body shot so cleanly knock a person down, and it was a good knockdown. You see, he was trying to hide the body shot. That's why I started pacing for the jab. Like, my man, Eddie Ford said, how are you doing, Eddie? Hope you're all right, baby. He said I should use a jab, get close to him. And I know he was trying to get to me. And that's after the jab started working, then he got to force his attack. And when he forced the attack, then I get to open the body shot. So it was right there for him. Picture that's perfect. basically exactly what the fight was like. You couldn't have said it better if you were a commentator. And I wish I'd have said it that good. Thank I you. just I want to ask you one last thing before we get over to Don King and what's going to happen to you in the in the future. Did you think this was properly stopped? Could it have been stopped earlier? I was just getting ready to stop him. He, he was lucky. <laughs> I was just getting ready. As a matter of fact, I just get warmed up. I train very hard because this is my whole man. I'm fighting for the citizens. So I make sure I work harder than usual. And now that I have a chance, the experience over the years, I know hard work pays off. All right. 90% of the time. And before we get to Don King, and, and let me let me give you a little surprise. This is Hedgeman's birthday. So I want to wish him a happy, happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday, Hedge. And uh, for Don King, what's coming up? Well, I think that the body snatcher has proved himself to be an invincible champion at this age, and he's really demonstrating that age is just a number. Uh, we're going to be fighting uh, Fabricio Tiozo, and then we want a unification match with Virgil Hill. So Virgil can get ready, and because Virgil is fighting, so he, I don't want him to let him stay off too long. I want to get him right back in with, with Tiozo, go right into Virgil Hill. When, when is the Tiozo fight? More or That'll less be one. in about June. About in June, mm -hmm. and then the other fight in the fall? In the fall. We'll be right there ready. Bring them both together, you know. So that's a unification kind a of unification a situation, fight. which it's we all like. a unification fight, and Virgil said he's ready, so the body snatchers demonstrated uh, inexplicably that he's ready. So we want to deal with this verdict, because Showtime has the best in boxing, and it's going to Showtime Championship Boxing. And shortly, and then you, nobody better than you to know, what can we expect from Mr. Tyson? He's coming out, isn't he? Against the explosive American Gerald McClellan. For more on that, let's go back to our New York studio and Bruce Beck. Thank you, Steve, and welcome back to our Showtime studios in New York City, our hub for tonight's transatlantic broadcast, a joint venture with our colleagues at ITV. And now we move down in weight from the light heavyweight ranks to the super middleweight division as we get set for the main event of the evening, the WBC super middleweight title. It's about between two two-time world champions, Nigel Benn and Gerald McClellan. Tonight, as McClellan seeks higher ground, we'll find out if he will be able to successfully move up from middleweight to super middleweight the way other 160-pound champions have done over the years. The roll call of successful champions who move from 160 to earn titles at the 168-pound limit is impressive. Leonard, Hearns, Barkley, Tony, Jones, and Ben are only a few of the luminaries on this list. How does McClellan Bobby Chez compare to the other 160-pound champions who have moved up? I think Gerald McClellan compares very well with many of the names on that illustrious list. He's a great puncher, a good boxer. He's learned a lot and matured well as a middleweight champion, and I think he will be super middleweight champion of the world. Is he ready for heavier opponents? I think in the 168-pound division, he is ready for any single one of those champions or other fighters. Is it the lure of the big payday which makes these guys want to ascend to the higher weight? You know, I don't think it's that simple, although I think the biggest thing is the big payday. Certainly it's out there. We fight for a living. It's our job. But it's also the challenge, fighters' egos. Can I move up? Can I beat the bigger man in his domain with his title? And there's also, as we talked about, father time, marching on, mother nature, adding a pound here and there. Sometimes we just can't get it off. But those three things, that'll bring every man up. So coming up, Gerald McClellan finds out if moving up in weight also means moving up in class. One thing's for certain, tonight he'll encounter an opponent who has an equally ferocious ring presence and a world champion with a similar devastating punching power. Nigel Benn has 32 knockouts in 42 fights. Gerald McClellan, 29 knockouts in 33 pro bouts. And between the two of them, they've combined to knock cold in amazing 33 challengers in the first round alone. Benn's KO power has been astonishing. McClellan's raw power, simply awesome. Gerald holds the record for the first and sixth fastest knockouts in middleweight championship history. Welcome to Boxing's Beat Up the Clock, starring Gerald McClellan. Since winning the WBC middleweight title from Julian Jackson, our 27-year-old contestant from Freeport, Illinois, has fought three times, impressively beating the clock each and every time. First, McClellan knocked out Jay Bell. In a stunning 30 seconds. Up 
the next contestant, Gilbert Baptist. In a nifty one minute and 37 seconds. And finally, Julian Jackson went down to Gerald in the rematch. In a snappy minute 23. Now, tonight, will he be able to do it again on boxing's feet up the clock? Mm, as far as I'm concerned, I wouldn't... My career might have never go over one or two rounds. I might fight the next four or five years without going uh, that many rounds. Just, uh, it depends on my opponent. Despite the brevity of his bout, it's been a long 21 months for Gerald McClellan, who's been besieged by a myriad of problems since winning the title. Difficulties with longtime trainer Emmanuel Stewart forced the end of their successful partnership. I just got rid of uh, Emmanuel Stewart for uh, personal reasons and went back to my amateur coach, uh, Stan Johnson from Milwaukee. Injuries to his hand disrupted his training and postponed his fights. Dislocated tendon on my knuckle. I got it fixed in, uh, about seven months ago. And I re-injured it again. It was, wasn't quite healed in the gym, so I just took some more time off. But it's been about six months, seven months. And perhaps most importantly, the constant struggle to make the middleweight limit of 160 pounds took its physical toll. It was extremely hard. I mean, it's something that I, that I would want to never do again, make that weight 160. It wasn't like I just didn't feel like losing it. I mean, I was cutting into my skin. I was, my color even changed from making weight. My voice even changed from making weight. That's when it's dangerous, so I had to leave it alone, give it up. And by giving it up and moving to 168 pounds, he enters one of the most competitive and potentially lucrative divisions today, inhabited by such marquee names and controversial figures as Roy Jones Jr., Chris Eubank, Vinny Pazienza, and of course, two-time champion and current WBC title holder, Nigel Benn. For the first 22 bouts of his career, Ben would have been a formidable opponent in any game of boxing's beat the clock for he won all of them by knockout, 19 of them before the end of the second round. But over the last two years, he has tempered his aggressive brawling style with a more cautious approach. Early, he throws a lot of punches at the start, but as we have been pointing out, he's starting in more cautious fashion here tonight. But for this fight, McClellan predicts the champion will revert to his wild, win-at-any-cost style. I see him coming out, trying to box. Uh, getting hit, getting hurt, and then when he get hit and get hurt, then he will go back to the old band, and, and uh, he'd be too shaken up from a punch to, uh, to continue, then he get knocked out. What will Gerald McClellan do tonight? Will he extend his stunning streak of short knockouts into the super middleweight division? Or will the champion Nigel Benn thwart McClellan's plans and retain his 168-pound title? Find out tonight on Boxing's Beat Up the Clock! Next to the Brown Bomber, Joe Lewis, no one has recorded more first-round knockouts and world title fights than Gerald McClellan. And McClellan is quick to point out that opponents are scared of him and beaten before the opening bell. Well, I've got some news for McClellan. Brit Nigel Benn, who served his country in Northern Ireland for 18 months with the patrooning 1st Battalion, isn't intimidated by anyone. Benn says, if I can survive in Northern Ireland, I can survive anywhere. That's why the ring doesn't hold any fear for me. McClellan's last two fights lasted a combined total of 180 seconds. Bobby Ches, could that hurt him if this fight goes rounds? You know, Bruce, I think that can only hurt him if he has predicted or planned that this fight is only going to do that and has not trained for the long haul. Gerald McClellan is a good fighter, but if he doesn't train to go the distance and a fight goes there, he too could be in trouble. Will McClellan have the same punching power at 168 pounds that he has at 160? Gerald McClellan is a classic puncher, a true puncher. He will hit you with whatever he weighs, 160, 168, or even more. He will turn all that weight into his punches. I still think he'll be a comparable puncher at a super middleweight. Will Ben continue to temper his slugging style, or will he revert to his old brawling battle plan? I really think that depends on how much the power of Gerald McClellan intimidates him or hurts him early. If early on he gets hurt, he may start to do a little more boxing, sneaking in and out, and maybe trying to unload. Otherwise, if his brawling tactics start to work and he seems to hurt Gerald, we're back to street brawls. Well, Chappie, I said earlier that you were a pugilistic pundit. It is now time for a prediction. You know, I have to stick with my man, Gerald McClellan. I believe in him. I believe he has the ability to unite this entire division by early to mid-round knockout or unanimous decision. 
Well, oftentimes the weigh-in offers some impressions on how the fighters approach about, and the weigh-in for this title fight was held yesterday, and both fighters look confident and focused. Hey, <laughs> this is McClellan's first world title fight in the 168-pound weight class. Why am I looking at this? I don't know what I'm looking at. Remember, McClellan has said that he walks around at 180 pounds when he's not fighting and admits he feels healthier and stronger at the higher weight. 11, 11 pounds. You know, only 165 pounds. I really expect it because he is so big for him to be close to the 168 pound limit, but I'm sure he's ready to fight because he looks like he's in great shape. A look now at the tail of the tape for Nigel Benn's seventh title defense of his WBC crown. Benn came in at the 168 pound limit, McClellan three pounds lighter. McClellan has almost a three inch height advantage and a three inch longer reach. Ben is 31 years of age. McClellan is four years his junior. Rules of the WBC are in effect. There is a 10-point must scoring system. Three judges will score the fight. There is no standing eight count. There is no three knockdown rule. Only the referee can stop the fight. And a fighter cannot be saved by the bell except in the last round. We are set to go for the WBC Super Middleweight Championship. Nigel Ben and Gerald McClellan. Let's return to Steve Albert and Ferdy Pacheco at London Arena. Thank you, Bruce, and welcome back to the sold-out and spirited London Arena on the Isle of Dogs in London's East End, just moments away from our main event, the WBC Super Middleweight Championship, Nigel Benn versus Gerald McClellan. Steve Albert back with the fight doctor, Ferdy Pacheco, and uh, while Ben and McClellan have certain similarities, Ferdy has been peaked while McClellan is only just beginning. I don't think peaked is the right word. He, he went up in weight and dragged too much weight with him. He lost his punch along the way. He is no longer what got him here, which is a big punching guy. It's curious how these two guys are actually mirror images of each other. They both started as being bangers. They came in. They have short fights. McClellan's still there. McClellan's still knocking people out. It remains to be seen tonight whether he's still got the, the punch at this weight. I think he has. And the other thing is his hands are so fragile because he punches so hard. But remember, McClellan has only had three one-round fights in a year. That hardly gets you in, in shape for this. I don't think that Ben has the ammunition to keep him off. And if you can't keep Gerald McClellan off, you're looking at a short night in London. Well, the local media has come down very hard on Nigel Ben. Not many people are, are picking Nigel. I think the only person who is is his father. Is, uh, is McClellan just too tough for Ben? I mean, he, after all, he is known as the man with the hardest punch in boxing. Well, if you, if you handicap fights and you look at them, you know, there are there are exceptions, there are those surprises, but, it, but, but this is the only one you can pick uh, because he's so overwhelming, because he's so strong, he's so aggressive, he's so mean, he's ready to kill this guy, Ben, and Ben is kind of cautious. He's got to say, I'm going to box, I'm going to, but, but, you know, he's not, it doesn't sound like he's going to do anything but defend. Now, theoretically, this is Nigel Ben's backyard here in London, England, but does he have the home crowd advantage? No, he doesn't. He is. He has actively campaigned and sought the public disfavor. No London audience like somebody that ducks them. All right, evening. let's go to Prepare Jimmy Lennon to Jr. for the intro of the ring walk. challenger, he is known as the G-Man. Introducing uh, Gerald McClellan. look at the challenger 27 year old Gerald McClellan led in by uh, Don King McClellan out of Freeport Illinois 31 and 2 29 knockouts his last fight this past May in Las Vegas he made quick work of former world champion Julian Jackson 83 seconds the man he originally won the WBC middleweight title from in 1993 He's made three defenses of his title, all by first-round knockout. Following that rematch victory over Jackson, McClellan had surgery on the right hand. And rather than take a chance by fighting in November, he decided to hold off until now. So after three defenses of the WBC middleweight title, he relinquished the belt. Tonight, Gerald McClellan steps up in wait for a crack at Nigel Benn's super middleweight crowd. McClellan makes it through the ropes. He goes from one.
160 to 168 tonight. Actually, he weighed in at 165. His walking around weight is around 180. And he knows full well that a victory can lead to a unification bout with Roy Jones Jr. He believes that Jones has been ducking him ever since he beat Jones in the amateurs in the 88 Golden Gloves. Now, the introduction of the champion. We go back and to Jimmy. And now, ladies and gentlemen, making his way to the ring, here is the defending world champion, introducing the Dark Destroyer, Nigel Benn. here at the London Arena. Here comes Nigel Benn. The sounds of Big Ben leading him in the flamboyant, fresh Nigel Benn. Not one to shy away from theatrical entrances. Britain's bad boy, 31 years of age, Despite his often outlandish and unpredictable behavior, one of the most popular fighters in British boxing history. Born and raised in Ilford, England, spends most of his time these days in Barbados for tax reasons. Here it comes. He'll be making the seventh defense of his title, which he's held out for over two years. 39, 2 and 1, 32 knockouts. Let's go back up to Jimmy Lennon Jr. right now for the official introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we ask you to rise for the playing of the national anthems. We will begin with the national anthem of the United States, immediately followed by the British national anthem. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen in attendance, boxing fans joining us across the UK on the ITV Sports Network and sports fans joining us around the world. We welcome you to the London Arena for the main event of the evening, Sudden Impact, brought to you by Frank Warren Sports Network and Don King Productions, as sponsored by Acclaim Entertainment. This bout is sanctioned by the World Boxing Council, President Jose Suleiman, Supervisor Ringside Enza Jacoponi. It is scheduled for 12 rounds of boxing, along with the British Boxing Board of Control, the steward in charge, Nipper Reed. Positions at ringside, Dr. Shapiro, Dr. Utar, and Dr. Ross. Timekeeper at the bell is Nick White. I introduce to you the judges, scoring this bout from ringside. Jose Juan Guerra, Anik Hongtonkam, and Franz Marti. Introducing to you the referee in charge of this main event. He'll be giving instructions after the introduction, Alfred Azaro. All right, fans, here we go with the main event of the evening. And now, ladies and gentlemen in attendance and boxing fans, joining us around the world. It's showtime with the WBC Super Middleweight Championship of the World. I introduce to you first the challenger on my left, fighting out of the red corner. He enters the ring wearing green trunks with white trim, fighting out of Freeport, Illinois in the United States. He weighed in at a trim and ready 11 stone, 11 pounds, or 165 U.S. pounds. His tremendous record includes 31 wins, 2 losses, 29 big wins coming by way of knockout, including 14 straight knockout victories. Here is the current WBC number one super middleweight contender, the former middleweight champion of the world, known as the G-Man, introducing Gerald McClellan. And his opponent across the ring is the defending champion on my right, fighting out of the blue corner. He is wearing black trunks with white trim, fighting out of and representing London, England. He weighed in at the super middleweight limit of 12 stone even, or 168 US pounds. His outstanding record includes 39 wins, two losses, one draw, with 32 wins coming by way of knockout. He is the former WBO middleweight champion tonight, making the seventh defense of his current title, introducing the WBC super middleweight champion of the world. Please welcome the Dark Destroyer, Nigel Ben. Once again, he is your referee in charge, Alfred Azaro. Now to give instructions. Yes, please. Break. Like head, okay, head, stop, stop, okay? Final instructions from Alfred Asaro of Paris, France. The crowd rallying behind the hometown guy, Nigel Venn. A nationalistic feeling here. But when they played the national anthem of Great Britain, it sent a shiver down your spine as we are set to go. Round one, scheduled for 12 here in London. Nigel Benn with the first punches. As we begin, some things to keep in mind. McClellan, the challenger, yet the favorite, goes in looking for the first round knockout. Great action to start things off here. Here's McClellan to the midsection. Nigel Benn comes right back. Ben uh, said he intends to go right at McClellan from the opening bell, but he could be playing into McClellan's hands. He, he's letting him, he's letting him punch, he's in trouble, he's, he's out down. the ring. Seconds into the fight, he's through the ropes. Nigel Ben is down. The count is six, he seven, can back eight, he can he make it back? back he arena. gets in at nine. Oh, what an incredible start. McClellan wants to come right back at Ben. He says, get out of my way to the referee. A right hand by McClellan. Ben continues to be in dire trouble. Can he survive this first round? He's letting McClellan get all the punches off. And the referee's giving him time. What's the ref doing? McClellan's fighting the referee off. 
left and fighting Ben. Combination of the head by McClellan. Ben trying to stay out of there. McClellan just punching away. What is this guy doing? The referee, Alfred Asaro of Paris, keeps stepping in for no unknown reason. Midway through the opening round, McClellan continues to smother Ben. No McClellan like a buzzsaw. No doubt about it. He wants that first round knockout. He promised everybody, and he's going after it. Ben's in trouble again as he staggered. He tries to fight back now, getting the roar from the crowd. Non-stop action from the opening bell. Here comes McClellan again to the body, to the head, to the head again. A wild left that misses by Ben. Ben connects with the left hand. McClellan comes right back to the midsection. They said this is going to be like Hearns and Hagler, and it is, but it's one way. It's all McClellan. Look how pushing different. and shoving tactics. Again, the referee steps in. What does he think he's doing, an amateur fight? It has not let up. Relentless attack by McClellan. Less than 30 seconds to go on the first round. It must seem like forever for Nigel Ben. McClellan should be punishing the body just like McCallum did, but he's not. He's going to the head. He's head hunting. A left hand by Ben. And McClellan steps back for the first time. And that's what he should have done. He should have stepped back and measured him instead of trying to overwhelm him. He's letting his reputation go to his head. He doesn't need a one-round knockout. He just needs a knockout. A thrilling, stirring opening round, and it's over. And it's only the first round. Well, stand by to watch replays because this is going to be something to see. The way McClellan tried to overwhelm him. Let's listen for a minute. The new trainer talking to Nigel Ben. He's got to dig himself out. There's hardly anything they can say except to drive in. Now let's watch. Let's watch the punch. Right hand, right behind the ear. A hook that missed. Another right hand behind the ear. And he goes through the ropes. Now, let me tell you, two good shots while he's unprotected. That should have knocked him out. Tough, tough guy. Tough guy to come back from that. He almost fell into the laps of the British broadcasters. He got back into the ring at the count of nine. So Ben knocked down and through the ropes 36 seconds or so into the opening round. Here's round two. The crowd is absolutely going wild here. Now Gerald trying to box a little. Oh, he got hit by a good right hand. Ben comes forward. A left hook by Nigel Ben. A wild miss with the right by Ben. There's the flicking left jab of McClellan, who's looking to settle down. Ben looked like he got himself back together, landed one good punch, and got a lot of encouragement. Between rounds, he looked over to Frank Bruno, as if for inspiration. Bruno sitting to his left on the crowd. Flip, hook by Ben. Bruno's the last guy to give him inspiration. Look at this. You see how... Another left by Ben. And McClellan backs away. And McClellan, McClellan is complaining about hit, getting hit in the back of the head, and he should. That's a foul. Good shot. Now Ben going to the uppercut. Unbelievable amount of energy that's been expended here in the opening four or so minutes. What's unbelievable is the comeback of Ben. Boy, he looks fresh after all that pummeling, and he is throwing bombs just like he did in his early career. He wants an early knockdown. Knockout. Listen to this crowd, the chanting, the singing. Good right hand by Ben. Another right, a left by Ben. But McClellan stands right in front of him. And McClellan holding on after all those punches, indicative of the fact that that's hurting McClellan. And he's still taking body shots just for fun. What a bounce back round for Nigel Ben, showing tremendous courage. He looked down and out. 
early in the first round. McClellan. He got knocked through the ropes. And McClellan might have burned himself out temporarily in that first round. He threw an awful lot of leather, and he's not doing anything except waiting to get hit here. And he is getting hit. The nonstop action, not letting up. Left hook by Ben. A miss by McClellan. McClellan getting wild now. Instead of settling down into boxing, he's getting wild. McClellan with a right but a glancing blow as Ben was able to tuck away. McClellan is dancing and Ben is chasing. No question about it. He's dominating this round as Ben. That didn't connect. The crowd will respond to anything from Ben at this point. That had a little more oomph to it, and there's the bell for round two. McClellan might have played his hand out in that first round, but he needed that to get back. Now, he got hit a lot, and he, and he showed it. Now, let's watch how he gets hit. These are up, it all misses. Now, that tires you out, but Ben is right on him. That's not a great hit, not, not compared to what he did in that round. Many of those were right on the, on the jaw and caused McClellan to hold on like that. Now, that is a great shot. And remember, this guy can punch. They say he left his punch when he went up, but he looks pretty good to me. We're not getting as good of audio as we're used to. Back in the space, they don't allow microphones in the corners as we enter round three. Round two is a good one for Ben, who came back well from almost being counted out in round one. Ben starts the third round off with a left hook. That sends McClellan back. Now, nobody's ever questioned Ben's courage or his desire to fight. That's one thing. We don't know what will happen with McClellan when things get to... Oh, nice uppercut by Ben. Stiff right uppercut by Ben. himself up but Ben missed Ben is missing he's a little bit too anxious now he almost feels like he's got this guy on the run and he has all through that second round he had him dominated this isn't a fight it's a Hollywood script well so much for a blowout this is no blowout this is a, a an absolute explosion of a fight good right hand by McClellan a short crisp right by McClellan that got Ben's attention and that quiets the crowd momentarily but one punch by Ben can change that. Well, it's McClellan that's got the power, but it remains to be seen as he got the heart to stand there with his gutty champion. Wasted motion by McClellan. He shouldn't be doing that. He's too good a fighter to throw punches like that away. You wonder how much longer they could keep up this energy. Now right now, McClellan's still in the recovery phase. He's not coming forward. He's letting the other guy burn himself up. Halfway point of round three. A miss by McClellan. Oh, it has been compelling action to this point. McClellan, the difference is missed all through the second round and is still missing in the third. This for the WBC Super Middleweight Championship. A right hand by Nigel Ben. They continue to stand toe to toe. A short right by Ben and an answer from McClellan. McClellan has got to be a little bit discouraged. He's so confident of his bombs and he's hit this guy with every bomb and Ben is still here and he still fights. Good left hand by McClellan from short range. 30 seconds, oh, right a hand. hard right by McClellan, and that staggers Ben. He's got Ben now, if he can get away from him. Ben again in trouble, but hanging in there. Swings a wild left. Final seconds of round three. Furious action. Look at the heart of Nigel Ben. It has been incredible.
back to our New York studio, Bobby Chez, Bruce Beck. And Bobby, a furious first three rounds. There are no chess players in London tonight. You could feel those punches coming clear across the ocean. They tested each other instantly. Does Ben have to stay on top of McClellan? Ben has to, because if you let McClellan sit back and fire up, you saw what happened in the first round. He forced Ben into this fight. This is Ben's best chance. What about Ben's medal thus far? Well, so far he's doing well. He, he's got, he's come back from coming off the canvas in the first round, out of the ring, to winning the next round, and that round, very close. Could McClellan have punched himself out in the first round? Could have used a little too much energy, loaded up with every shot. Sometimes that's a mistake. Back to Steve and Ferdy at the London Arena. <laughs> been electrifying up to this stage. Here we go, Nigel Benn, the champion of the black trunks, Gerald McClellan, the challenger in the green with the white stripe. You can see why Ben has been a favorite all these years. He's a gutty, hearty guy, and he just doesn't stop coming. Here's a guy that was not clear through the ropes about 36 seconds into round one. It he took him to the count of nine to get back into the ring. Showing them an amazing amount of guts, Nigel Ben. Referee having a lot of trouble separating. Holding and hitting by Ben, the warning. And then the warning to McClellan. Right hand, lunging right by Nigel Ben. Then his seventh title defense. He almost saw it all go out the window in the first round, but he has stormed back with tremendous heart. You gotta wonder what's going through the mind of McClellan right now. He thought he had him. Well, McClellan's waiting too long to let the other guy get started. Now, his whole plan was to pound the side so that his arms would come down, McClellan's throwing, but he hadn't done that because he almost got an easy knockout. He got out of his game plan. He got into a fist fight instead of a boxing match. McClellan, who usually fights as if he's double parked, many first round knockouts. He almost had another one here. His last three fights, first round knockout. The question is, if this goes on and on and on, Ben is the one who has gone the distance. McClellan rocked with a left hook there. McClellan, who hasn't gone past round eight in his career. Sometimes he looks too confused when he gets hit by a hard hand. He almost looks like it's, it's, he's got cobwebs in his head, like right then. Ben is just winding up, throwing vicious lefts and rights. Combination by Ben. And McClellan just hangs on. They're just swapping rounds here. That last round was McClellan. It looked like he was coming back, and now it's Ben that looks like he's coming back. What a fight this is, and what a crowd. These people are going crazy here. Sell out, 11,000 strong, cheering from the outset. A left and a right by Ben. That sends McClellan back pedaling. Eight. Gerald just did what every boxer dreads, every trainer, going straight back and leaning back against the punch. That's when you get killed, and he did. He got hit twice. McClellan missing with that right, guarded well by Ben. McClellan looking, looking less and less like he's got a game plan, like he's just in there trying to land that punch. That whole thought of, of hitting the side so the guard would come down has gone out the window. peek a style by McClellan. Ben penetrating with the left is the bell sound. They're trading rounds here. The only difference in this fight right now is that knockdown that gave him a 10-8 round. Yes. And he barely got back in there. I really didn't think he could make it back in there. He was in such bad shape, but he made it back and survived. You gotta give Ben a huge amount of credit. Huge. Nigel Ben on the attack. Let's take a look at the at Nigel. See, Nigel's going first. He, he is letting the other guy pose. He's posing right now. Both, he's first. He looked like he was going to come with a left hand. He threw the right first. He's out thinking him. That's exper more experience in long fights. Ben is doing is out thinking Gerald McClellan. McClellan, once the power is gone from a puncher and he's and he's left to, with an experience, that's when the stuff gets hard. That's when it's going to get hard, right now, around about five, six, seven. Now it's going to be a tough time. Ever since that first round knockdown, McClellan has neutralized, been neutralized by Ben. Nigel Ben 
has taken away the ferocious ring presence of Gerald McClellan. Then being warned to keep the punches up, round number five for the WBC Super Middleweight Championship. A thriller in London. Changing up. Sometimes he fights right, sometimes he fights left. Look at this. He's throwing out. Yes, McClellan now switching to southpaw. And he goes back. Now he's back Starting to conventional back. with yeah. the jab. He's oh, a right hand by Ben that got in. That switching is a waste of time because what's happening to him is being outspeeded and outthought by uh, the KG champion, Nigel Ben. Ben is not thinking. McClellan has been taken out of his game plan. A thumping left hook by Ben. McClellan looks confused. The KG Nigel Ben now seems to have gained control of this fight. The holding by McClellan, the warning from referee Alfred Azzaro. Oh, nice shot. Nice shot by Gerald. Nice right hand. Beautiful feinting by Ben and lands with the right. Midway. Tentative to the right fifth. hand. Gerald's no longer throwing with a lot of speed. He's, he's tentative. It's like he's not sure he's going to hit there. And he, when he hits, nothing's going to happen. It's those little quick punches that he's throwing that can hurt Ben. But Ben looks like he's found some new source of energy. Boy, has he got some kind of energy going for him now. A second win. He has been resurrected after that near downfall in the first. Nigel Ben of the Black Trunks, the Dark Destroyer. The crowd 100% behind him. Gerald fighting with the mouthpiece half yes. out, and indicating that, he's getting tired. That usually means fatigue setting in. Now this is what we talked about, these tough middle rounds. McClellan apparently not throwing the right with real intentions. He had surgery on the right hand after his last fight. He's been out nine and a half months. I wonder if that is factoring in now. Well, you better forget about it for now, because he's got a tiger on top of him right now. And he's got pain, he better swallow it because right now he's, gonna, he's about to lose his mouthpiece. He, he, can't, he cannot breathe correctly. That mouthpiece gives him some leverage. Oh, Rosas exchange toe to toe in the center of the ring. Less than 30 seconds to go in the fifth. The mouthpiece of McClellan continues to hang out. But he's doing a little bit better in the punching. He's out punching Ben. As Ben looked like he was about to overwhelm him for the for this uh, round, he came back to Gerald. So here at the London Arena in London, England. We are between rounds five and six in a fight that has become a war. Well, it's an even fight right now, Stephen. I've, I've got this thing dead even, and I'm, I, you know, it, it's just hard. They're just swapping parts of rounds, but uh, it, it appears that uh, the guy that's doing the out thinking, out punching is the champion, uh, Michael Ben, and Gerald McClellan looks like he's getting his forces together, but he's getting tired. If you're just joining us. Ben was knocked down and through the ropes around 36 seconds in round one. He managed to get back through, hit the canvas at the count of nine, and Ben has put on a brilliant comeback since. McClellan now seems to be having trouble breathing through his big mouthpiece. Round six underway. Oh, oh a, a butt there on the part of Gerald, but nothing happened, but it was a good butt. Ben with a crisp right hand. McClellan continues to try and fend off the onrushing champion, Nigel Ben. Thumping right hand by McClellan. Quite unofficially, he's made this an even fight as um, uh, Ben's brave stand and is continuously chasing McClellan. McClellan's got to make it go the other way. So, look at that. As he McClellan has... holds with the left, Ben hits him with the other hand. And the referee much too fussy for my taste, much too fussy. Takes him too long to give instructions. The referee Alfred Azaro of Paris. He has been very involved from the outset. 
McClellan's got to do something to turn this around. These rounds are beginning to pile up on him. He's just not used to going this far. His fights average two points, three rounds. And he's doing what he never did before. Punch once or twice and watch. I mean, he, he, he always was three, four punches, and he's not doing that now. See, one punch, you watch. Two punches. Now, that's the first time he's thrown combinations, and he missed all of them. Halfway through round six. But at least he threw them, which is more than he was doing before. And you have to wonder now if Ben's 85 rounds of championship experience are taking their toll on the less experienced McClellan. He, he, he just landed three something body shots in McClellan. Then got him on the ropes, only landed one and let him tie him up. McClellan indicated the referee's being hammered on the back of the head. No warning. That's bad news. He shouldn't even bother with the referee. He's got his guy in front of him. That must mean he's starting to get frustrated. Now he slipped a little McClellan. He looked down at the floor as Ben takes dead aim at the midsection of McClellan. McClellan now just hanging on. He's really not doing it much anything in there. That's nothing corner work. I mean, he's not really punching hard. Might be some points being built up, but nothing really. That, now that was better. And that was better. And Ben comes out with a left hook. Those were punches. Well, McClellan's up there with the big guys now. He's moved up in weight. Yeah. yeah, but he is the big guy. He's much bigger than Ben. He's much bigger than Ben. He's taller than Ben. He weighed 165. Uh, ben was at 168. But you got to believe McClellan is easily 168 as the fight began. Oh, easily. I mean, the last time he lost 11 times. Oh, there oh, goes, goes the mouthpiece. The mouthpiece. Finally. The mouthpiece was hanging precariously the last few rounds, and it finally goes up. They're still going at it after the bell. Ben got a few more licks in. Now Ben fouls. He saved the round. He saved the round big because it looked like McClellan was in trouble, and that mouthpiece coming flying out will convince any judge that he is in trouble and tired. Boy, this thing is taking a nasty turn for Joe McClellan. It was a good punch, and that convinces judges, and those points are building up. I have now got Ben going out ahead. And Frank Bruno giving encouragement to Nigel Ben. Ben is getting a lot of warning for holding, for hitting behind the net, but no points have been taken away thus far. They can't even hear the bell. McClellan's still sitting. It is so loud in here. Well, McClellan doesn't look like he's interested to come out and do battle. To tell you the truth, he looks like he's losing heart. Round seven, many thought it would not go this far. We're at the halfway point, scheduled for 12 for the WBC Super Middleweight Championship. Nigel Ben, who was knocked down and through the ropes in the opening seconds of the fight, has fought back valiantly. Now that was a borderline low blow, I mean, uh, Foul. A clubbing right hand by McClellan. To the back of the head. We saw what happened in Mexico City with that. No caution to the north. Yes, we did. More right, warning. Hey, Look don't out. push McClellan. the referee. Oh, that's the way to get disqualified. He's been upset with the referee all night. Now, that looks like... It, lo it looks like Buckley... I mean, um, Gerald McClellan has finally been told by his corner, this is going away from you, buddy. You better start fighting here. Men's philosophy is do anything you can to win. Some might interpret that as dirty tactic. He's getting away with a lot here tonight. Well, they're letting him get away with that. Not the referee, Gerald McClellan. Gerald McClellan has no business letting him get away with that. That's amateur stuff. He should be able to smother that. Plus, he's waiting too long. See, oh, nice, nice hook. That's the kind he needs. A hook and a counter punch. He's waiting too long for the other guy to start. He's got to start first. Here goes Ben again, sending McClellan back. McClellan. McClellan's fighting like a bullfighter now. He's got to watch out. That was the old Matador play. Yeah, he's fighting like a bullfighter. Right hand by Ben. That nailed McClellan on the side of the head. Well, you can't put your arm up there and not expect an old veteran like this to come over it. Ben just continues to score points with the judges. The judges from Monterey, Bangkok, and Switzerland. Looks like a little blood on the on the uh, 
Left to oh. The right. with a left uppercut. And, and Ben says, come on. That was nothing. Come on. And who backs up? Gerald McClellan backs it's up. Incredible environment. The crowd chatting. Behind Nigel Ben. Left Once hand of the neck by Ben. Once again, McClellan waits and waits and waits like he's going to throw a punch. The other guy who is going to throw a punch. Stupid on his part. God, if I was in the corner, you have to holler at him. Don't pose. Throw the punch. But he waits. The other guy throws it. Less than 30 seconds left in the seventh. McClellan sometimes almost in slow motion. Still, he's doing all right this round. It's Ben that's taking the hard shots this round. See, see this, this, where he just waits there. Un unbelievable. Here's Ben spinning McClellan around in the corner. No damage done, but it looked good for Ben. Round seven is history. Let's go to Bobby Chez in New York. All right, Bobby, is it turning into a war of attrition? I'll tell you what, it certainly is. It's back and forth, back and forth. You take this part of the round, I'll take the latter part. Bomb after bomb. They're both loading up, I think, far too much. Nobody's got a regularly sustained attack. One round here, one round there. Very close fight. The difference in this entire fight come down to the finish line, maybe the knockdown. How do you have it scored right now? Well, right now I have the fight uh, a point for Gerald McClellan. Uh, it's real close. What about McClellan with the mouthpiece hanging out? He looks like he's having terrible problems with his mouthpiece. It doesn't look like a custom-fitted one. I don't know what his problem is. Seven rounds in the books. Let's go back to London Arena to Steve Albert and the fight doctor, Ferdy Pacheco. All right, Bruce, thanks very much as we get ready for round eight. Round eight. Well, I can, I can only wish that Bobby Chez was here with us sitting down watching this because this is a fighter's fight. A boxer it would enjoy this more than anybody. This is the kind of fight you pray for. Two guys just taking one round, the other part of the round. The other part, you can't figure out who's ahead. I have a dead even, but it could either be a point either way. I mean, I, it's hard. It's, it's hard. They're just going half a round apiece. It is possible that the only round McClellan won was round one, maybe round three. Well, McClellan won one big 10-8 round, and he's had other rounds that are good. Look, look at this. He starts out great. Look at this start. McClellan. Now, he should, he should be going to the body here. He let him off. Last time he had him on the ropes like that, he drove him out of here and onto the canvas outside the ring. Oh, not landing. Nigel Fenn marching on. But those are the ones that don't do any damage, the marching on things. The interesting thing here is that Nigel... Nigel Benn, as he wraps his hand around, Gerald McClellan has obviously fallen in love with his power. He hasn't really had to box. His boxing skills have been questioned, and right now he's trying to end this with his slugging proficiency, but not having much luck. Now, see, that was good defense on the part of McClellan. The crowd roared because the attack was on the part of the champion, Ben, but he missed most times. That's against him, not for him. I mean, you do also score defense. Gerald is just too lackadaisical in defense. He's waiting too long. The old scream of you first is what's ringing in my mind. If I was in the corner, that's what you got to be hollering. You first, don't look at him. Go, go. There oh, a heavy right, right hand by McClellan. And you don't, nobody has to scream at, at Nigel because Nigel hears that himself. He's being first all the time. Ben showing a stern chin. Misses with the wild left. He's trying to end it on one punch. McClellan with a hard right, followed by a left. Ben's in trouble. He's staggered against the ropes. McClellan now working the body and the head. A relentless attack. Back comes Nigel Ben out of nowhere. A right hand by McClellan. And referee is close to stopping this. Ben buckled over. A right hand by McClellan. Less than 30 seconds of the round. Down goes Ben. Ben is in horrible shape. And there's too much time to go. Too much time to go. Here comes McClellan. Here comes the charge of the light brigade. Toe to toe in the center. Here's Ben again looking. McClellan. From somewhere, Ben got up enough energy to throw two power punches. And that saves him from being stopped here. Because at least he's here. He's fighting. But McClellan is spent. Just leaning on 
Nigel Benn. What a round. Boy, are they working on Nigel Benn, and they better work on him because he was out in that corner. One well round, one well landed bomb by McClellan, it would have been over. McClellan tried, he just couldn't do it. He didn't finish, but here, let's look at this work. Let's look at the work. Right hand, right on top of the floor. You see the damage. All the way back into the ropes, and now, wang, if he didn't landed that, it was over. But you have to give Bent credit. He sure took a lot of punches, and he missed that. Can you see how many punches are missed? If, if McClellan had gone to the body, taken the time, and worked good, there's one good body shot, there's one good body shot, and now he's going over the top, and he can't hit over the top when the guy's bending down. An uppercut was called for there, and he wasn't. That was more of exhaustion knockdown than a punch knockdown. But so, nonetheless, he is now ahead by two points. So now, McClellan with the momentum. Ben almost out in that eighth round. He went down with about 20 seconds to go in the round. We're into un charted territory for Gerald McClellan. First time past round eight in his entire career. But he's got a sinking battleship in front of him. All he needs to do is finish. Finish big. I mean, Bent is on the way and he's sinking, but he's got heart. Look at back at him. He's try still trying to fake that he's in this fight. A lunging shot by Ben, but it made no contact. And the crowd responding to anything that Ben does. Great energy, great heart on the part of Ben. Boy, he is halfway out of this fight, and he's still in there trying to finish. He has no legs, Ben. He is fighting on instinct, fighting on heart. Can McClellan finally put him away? McClellan again with that fatal flaw of waiting too long. He should be all over the sky in a methodical attack. Not crazy, methodical. I don't know what he's talking about. This referee. Thank God. Again, a lunging left. No problem for McClellan, overhand right to the back of McClellan's head against Ben. Again, Ben getting uh, away with it. Rabbit punching. Oh, more talk. Being warned about that from the referee. He punched and then he slipped. Nigel oh, he, oh he, and he hit him in the eye. Nigel got hit in the eye. Look at that. Butted, butted on the way down. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Here we go. So McClellan says get up he says let's continue McClellan went down to one knee and now here we go round nine continues a slapping left by Ben no no impact yeah, but that, that was not kind of a knockdown by any means he was no. just trying to clear his head he got butted real hard and he's, he's done it again again he you know that doesn't help all that bowing when you keep doing the damage with the head a lot of fouling tactics well he's waiting too long waiting too long he's waiting too long then bouncing off those loose ropes he comes back with a short left hand nigel ben less than 30 seconds remaining in round nine good defensive move by ben well, he's still got that going, despite the lack of legs. His legs are so rubbery. He, he, it's just a miracle. He's still up. I mean, he just can't control his legs. He can't get them in the right position. That last display, that last flurry at the end of the eighth round really took the steam out of Nigel Benn when he went down. Now the jab by McClellan. And McClellan's still winking his eyes, still hurting, and he's got, he got hit hard. McClellan landing a right at the bell. Nine rounds complete. You're going to the 10th round. But well, I can't tell you if anyone's ever seen before because you've been there already. You're in the 10th round. This man cannot win this fight unless he gives this fight to him. He cannot win. Do you so far behind me? And that... Uh, yep. Yeah, well, look, look at the head. Look at the head. That's, that's where it's at. See him? Look, look. It went right to his eye. He rubbed all of that, uh, uh, his hair, and all of that, look, look, boom, right in the eye. Oh, boy, that was nasty stuff. Nasty stuff. The dreadlocks went right into the eye of McClellan. And McClellan. Kevin Sanders urging Nigel Ben on ferociously. And in the other corner, they said, 
They said you couldn't go 10. Well, you've already been 10. Now, come on. Stan Show us Johnson. what we got. Yes, Stanley you can't Johnson. lose this fight, he said to him. You're too far ahead. Well, he's not that far ahead, pal. It could happen, but it would really be an upset because he's been down twice and he's down to you. Round number 10 for the WBC Super Middleweight Championship. Just an incredible night. Nigel Benn hoping that he got a second win between rounds. A left hand by McClellan. McClellan now with a burst of energy dancing around. Licking the left. The only way he can lose this, well, he, he can lose it many ways, but one of the ways is to get very cautious and not fight 10, 11, and 12. That's three rounds. You can't give it away. you got to fight. A very confident Gerald McClellan. Ben just looking to hang on. You shouldn't get that confident. You should not get confident. Right hand by Ben, just as you say that. And McClellan goes down to one knee. It's a knockdown. You better get up. He gets up at seven. Now that is the strangest knockdown I've seen. It came out of nowhere. Everybody on their feet, 11,000 strong. Just what, we're, ben. just what we're talking about, what he can't afford to do. He goes down again. What's hurting him? Something is hurting him. Gerald McClellan. I don't know. His he's side, squinting. head, something. He's not going to get up. It doesn't look like. It's over. Michael Ben has won. I can't believe that. I've never seen a guy quit in the corner like that. What was that? I can't believe that. Just what we said. He can't afford. Things happen. Bizarre endings to a fight in one of the most compelling fight nights you'll ever see. It just didn't seem possible. It did not seem possible this guy can run for the head of government now. I mean, <laughs> what a comeback. And look, and look at Gerald is in the corner. Gerald's in the corner. He doesn't even want a stool. He's sitting on a ring. He's slumped He's in the corner. On the slumped on the canvas in the corner. They better get somebody in there to look at him. Something's bothering him. I he kept winking his eye. He got butted in the eye, and he went down twice in that tenth round. And unbelievably, Nigel Benn, who looked to be out on his feet, victorious. It could be some kind of injury, such as a fracture of the orbit. It could be some kind of neurological injury, or it could just be a heart problem. He quit with his heart. I mean, let's face it, this kid just out gutted him. What, what happened, we'll have to wait and see now in these minutes when the doctor's up there what has happened to Gerald McClellan. Well, let's take a look at the first knockdown of that round. I mean, we, we didn't see a punch that was worthy. Now, that one went over his head, that one went over his head, and he went down. I, that was like a voluntary, listen, I think I'm quitting. And I look at this, if this is the same one, that, now that one got, now that guy, that was hit. That was a hit. It isn't enough to knock him down. Now, that misses, that misses. Could be that punch way back there that did it to him, but he certainly didn't go down. Here comes the, the, the second in the resignation because he, his eyes were wide open. He wasn't rocky. There was no reason for him to go down. If there's no big effective punch that puts him down. This is an absolute resignation. He's down, that's all. In front. As, as we're looking at this, it, it begins to fill me with even more wonder and doubt. Because somebody with the heart of Gerald McClellan, because he's fought hard and so forth, just would just quit. I mean, that wasn't anything but quit unless something happens to him. And uh, we can't know. Now, now the, par the paramedics are out there, and they've got him stretched out. Now, now action is going on as people are trying to come into the ring. But he is on his back. He's stretched out is Gerald. They've now, take a look. They've turned the him paramedics. over. They've turned him over to the side, and he is in all kinds of difficulty in the corner. They should Gerald push McClellan. those people back and let the doctor work. Push him back. Now they're looking. See, now they do have. See, as 
we have stated before clearly this might be a fracture of the orbit. It yeah. might be that with that headbutt, he has fractured his orbit. You don't know in, in which place, what's it going to be. Bernie, we can only speculate. Let's hope it's not a head injury or anything of that nature. But there's something when a boxer just quits voluntarily. It's, it's too much heart, too many things going on in a fight that you're ahead. It just doesn't compute. Something is wrong. Whatever it is, is wrong with him. Hey. And he's laying down here. They're going to have to take him. They've got the stretcher in. Unlike Mexico City, we've got two paramedics here. We've got the doctor right on top of him. This is baffling. It's one of the most bizarre scenes I've ever seen. In one corner, they've got Gerald McClellan over in the corner there with doctors trying to uh, make sure he's okay. And on the other side, they've got a victorious celebratory Nigel Fenn being interviewed. They're putting a neck brace on him, which indicates it could be a neck injury as well, or just the fact that they don't want to run the risk. There could be something wrong with the neck so that you don't want to move him. That's exactly the right thing to do, by the way. Medically, excellent work. Excellent work in a corner. Well, Ferdy, if he does have a serious injury, either to the eye or to the head or whatever, at least he had the sense to kneel down and stop. Yep. May, may, and that's the way you have to look at it, but what will that make it? Will that make it a disqualification? What will that make it? Because that happened on a bus. So this is not by no means over. This title fight is still going on, only it's going on with one man on the canvas. His eyes are, we're told now, his eyes are closed. He appears to be unconscious. Did I just see his eyes open? Maybe it's just hope. Right. And it might just be, it might just be exhausted also you know it might just be they're giving him oxygen now now oxygen comes on oh. they've got a neck brace on him i mean mcclellan is being treated as if he is a serious case right now we're told and he was uh, spitting up blood earlier but that that goes with you know that goes with being in this kind of a fight i, I, I discount that but i think uh, a headbutt uh, and uh, and the fact that he voluntarily went down feeling that there's something wrong with him someplace uh requires Examination. You have to do cat scans. You're gonna have to do a lot of things to find out what this guy's got. This in the meantime, we don't know who's the champion. This continues to be just loopy. The crowd is cheering, chanting, almost oblivious to the fact. Ladies and gentlemen, please clear the that aisles. McClellan we need to take. Is having Carol this kind McClellan of difficulty in his corner. Aisle. Please clear the aisles. Assist us. We need to get him out quickly. Clear now a smart aisles. announcement Thank by Jimmy Lennon Jr. to clear the aisles. They may have to rush him. Uh, into an ambulance. Yes, I think they will not have the same trouble out in Mexico. They have very strong Clear police here. The aisles, please. Thank you for your assistance. So this is a, a sad sight Clear indeed, as Gerald McClellan is attended to being uh, given oxygen in the corner there by the uh, physicians. I must say, in all the years I've been in boxing, I've never seen a guy just quit in a championship fight because he recognizes he's got an injury, can't see, he's got double vision, something's going on with him. And in the meantime, he hasn't moved. His eyes continue to be closed. Meanwhile, the celebration continues for Nigel Ben. You talk about a schizophrenic situation. This is crazy. One place is jubilation, and the other place is serious dejection because anything could be happening here. We're going to try to get Nigel Ben over here, Ferdy, so we can get an explanation. Nigel Ben making his way over to our left, and Ferdy Pacheco is making his way over. Meanwhile, the doctors continue to work on Gerald McClellan. They continue to work on McClellan, the paramedics and the doctors over there. So our prayers are with Gerald McClellan in the corner. Let's go over to Ferdy, who's standing by with Nigel Benn. The one person I want to say hello to back in America is Roy Jones. He's a top boy. If I'm going to class myself as the best super middle in the world, I've got to be Roy Jones. And Roy Jones, lad, I'm very happy for you beating the, the mouth, James Tony. What, what do you think happened when he quit in, in such a, a, a apparently not hurt kind of a situation? What was that? He was hurt. He sustained a lot of punching power to the head. He's did did the, the butt do anything to him? Did no, you butt no, head? No, no, no. Come on, come on, we're in the middle of something. No, 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 no. You, look at, you predict him a win. No, so this is my time now. Okay. My time. And the thing about it, you know, it wasn't that to do with a head butt. It just couldn't sustain the pressure. All them two rounds and all that don't mean nothing. Because when you go in the later rounds, that's when you find But were you still. shocked to see him go down on a knee yeah. and stay there? I'm glad I was going to finish him there and then. But you thought, what's he going down I for? Thought, no, no, I didn't think he was going down. He sustained a lot of punching power all through 
screwed around. But Nigel, there wasn't one clear shot to put him down. I mean, the, the TV no. shows you missed twice, and the guy yeah, goes down. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so what? He put me down twice. But that's when it proves that you know I've got a heart. And you have. Was writing, well, me, writing me off. Don, right now, now there's Don a guy King, laying on a stretcher over right, there. Don King, I wait, wait, wait. Let, 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 let me, right. let, Nigel. Don't leave. Don't leave a minute. Okay. Right, the guy's laying on a stretcher over there. If it was ruled for a foul, then this the whole thing is up in the air. You don't know who the champion is. No, I don't think so. I think that uh, I don't know what the ruling is going to be. But all I can say is that Nigel. Been and proved to the world today he got a lot of hearts, a lot of Keonis. He fought his behind off. He was outside the ring, got back in, got knocked down twice. He rose to the occasion, got to give him his just due. Well, you deserve to have the last laugh, so I'm giving you the last laugh. Tell it. <laughs> Tell it. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Freddie. I think it's one person I, I think I need to fight to class myself as the best in the world is Roy Jones. I know Roy Jones is different class, but to me, to call myself the best in the world, I think I would have to fight Roy Jones. But at the that's moment... Unified, that's unified the other WBA title. And then okay. you got two and Roy has one. Okay. And then we go for Roy. Just like I All promised right. you. Well, congratulations. I've seen a lot of your fights, great, but great none fight. as gutty as that. Great, great fight, man. Great fight. Back to Steve. No, uh, well, just a minute. Let's, let's look and see. All right, McClellan. McClellan still on the campus. Look at the difference between here and Mexico City. These guys are really taking care of business. They got a neck brace on them. They got oxygen on them. They're trying to clear. What could be wrong? They got everything on him. I don't know what happened to Gerald, but he put on his knee, and so we don't know it until we can sit down and talk to him to find out. But all I can say is that we had one great fight on Showtime, and that we was demonstrated tonight by Nigel Ben, a man with a lot of heart well, and a lot of intestinal courage. You, you got that right, but we do have a consideration. This guy hasn't moved. He hasn't opened his eyes. They got oxygen on they the head, taking him out. Working on Something's him. wrong. What, what and, did that damage? There's something, there's something up in his eye or around his yeah, neck. Yeah, he kept you know, and weakening. We, we're, we're worried about that. Well, but, he's, what, but he can still talk, and so what are you doing? What's the headbutt there? part of that? I don't know. I don't know. We I saw it on say. TV, and that was a hell of a headbutt. Oh, you saw a headbutt on TV? And he, and he winked. And he, and he had asked for time out. I mean, you know, it was like he was bothered by the headbutt. And then when he came back, he didn't get hit. He went down on his own. As a Twice. Yeah. Twice he went down. I've yeah. never seen a fighter do that when he's fighting for the championship. So uh, here I think um, the champion Nigel Ben went out and said something to the corner, but I don't think he can. nobody can communicate with Gerald. I think he's out. No, Gerald is laying there. They're talking to Gerald to see what it is that's bothering him, but they got him stressed out, and these guys are really doing a proficient and effective job. They're really working on him, as you say, taking care of all the medical needs that can be assisted to him right now. Well, he'll be coming the through here. As long as he doesn't be hurt. Well, he'll be coming through here in a, in a moment. But let's go back to New York and see what they're thinking. Bobby Chez, a phenomenal fight, ends up as a bizarre fight. Uh, very bizarre. I think that something had to happen maybe around one of the uh, orbital bones around the eye, somewhere around his eye socket. It looked like that's where he got smashed pretty good the round before the fight was stopped. He wasn't quite the same after. Something was bothering him. Might have even been a, in the jaw area under the eye. I don't know. Something was wrong. He was winning the fight. He was getting a little stronger, showing a good second win. Punches were starting to pile up. I take no credit away from Nigel Ben. I think he's a great fighter. And the Nigel Ben who fought Chris Eubank the second time did show up, and we had a great fight for a good long time. I still think Chris, uh, Gerald McClellan could have won this fight, but I don't know what happened. Did you ever see a situation before where a fighter went down on his own voluntarily in a situation where he's ahead? And, and yeah, the, I've and seen it happen before. I, I saw a fight once. Uh, Ray Mercer fought uh, Francesco Damiani. hit him with an uppercut, cracked his nose in half, and the next thing you know, he's standing there and he just took the knee and said, that's enough of this, I've had it. All right, Bobby, it let's happens. go back and take a look at some of the action from this fight. Obviously, right now, more than anything, we uh, have concern for the health of Gerald McClellan, but this fight had so many different ebbs and flows throughout. It really started with McClellan uh, sending Ben through the ropes in the second round. I mean, there were so many different parts and twists to this fight. You know, if we look at that again in slow motion, we might be able to find out more if that leaping punch did something to Gerald or the head that followed in. It appeared that his head slammed into him, too, before uh, Nigel Ben fell. You know, freakish accident. This is one of our occupational hazards, and it's not a nice one. First and eighth rounds, you really had two-point rounds favoring Gerald McClellan. You had the big knockdown in the first where he sent Ben through the ropes, and then in the eighth where, with the right hand, he again knocked Ben down. Well, you know, he is a power puncher, and I told you he was going to bring that up to this weight. He showed a pretty good chin, too, because he got hit with some tremendous blows himself. I still don't know. I'd like to hear from Gerald or someone in his corner as, as to exactly what happened. It could have just been a cumulative effect that took its toll, as that sometimes does. 
This was one of those classic fights, though, Bobby, that uh, was really brilliant back and forth. A guy was ahead for 30 seconds of one round. Somebody else came back the last 30 seconds of another round. Oh, yeah, this was a serious ebb and flow type of fight. I had the fight very close going into the 10th round, just a point or two for Gerald, and those were just based on the knockdowns. The rounds were pretty close to even. But more than anything else right now, uh, we are just standing by to find out the status of Gerald McClellan, and obviously that's where our concern is. Well, I know him personally, having broadcasted so many of the fights, and I like him, so I am concerned, and also as a boxer, I'm very concerned. All right, let's go back to ringside to Steve Albert and Ferdy Pacheco at London Arena. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, guys. We, uh, good news, he's talking now, Gerald McClellan. They gave him two injections. He was talking. Uh, you hear the applause in the background as uh, they're trying to get him uh, to an ambulance off to our right. I just received word, and this even adds uh, more craziness to this already bizarre night, that Nigel Ben just collapsed in his dressing room. I'm not sure what that's all about. It may have been just exhaustion. Let's just hope it's emotion and exhaustion. Yeah, I, th I think it's emotion and surprise. What a night. He was brought up here. He's been given two injections. That's what brought him back around. That, that snaps you back around. That does not necessarily mean he's out of trouble. I mean, what it means is they got to find out why this collapsed three times he went down to indicate something is wrong up there. Now, he, his main complaint was around his eye. He was blinking, but then his neck got stiff on him. Now they put a, a, a collar on him. Now they put injections. Now they strapped him on and took him out. The interesting other thing is another person walked through here and said, well, the problem also is that Nigel, when he went outside the rope, stayed outside 15 seconds by official count instead of 10. That's the first one we ever heard about that. It'll be good to, to, put a, uh, to put a clock on it and see how long he stayed out. It, it seemed extraordinarily long to me, to tell you the truth. I thought he was out. Well, so, uh, that's about it. As, uh, as uh, he makes his way out on the stretcher to the ambulance, again, you can hear the crescendo of applause here. Any, any final comment? Yes, I, I'm amazed. Both fighters have collapsed. I'm amazed at the finish. This is not over. This is not over yet. And so we will find out in a few minutes or a few hours when they take them where we're at as far as who's the champion and what's happened to both fighters. The end of a wild, compelling, bizarre night here at the London Arena in London, England. Steve Albert and the fight doctor, Ferdy Pacheco. Let's go back to Bruce Beck in New York. Thank you very much, Steve Albert and Ferdy Pacheco. And right now, as we do in all our telecasts, it is time to present the Fighter of the Night Award. A special panel of judges comprised of members of the media covering tonight's action have voted on the Fighter of the Night. Tonight's panel includes Ken Jones of The Independent, Jean-Michel Rollier of La Keep, and Sri Kumar Sen of The London Times. The ballots are in. Let's see how our judges voted. And the winner is Nigel Benn. There you have it. Congratulations to Nigel Benn on being selected as Fighter of the Night. A $15,000 donation will be made by Don King Productions and Showtime Networks Incorporated in the name of Nigel Benn to the United Negro College Fund, the National Hispanic Scholarship Fund, and the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. Well, Bobby Ches, it was a wild night. It began with Mike McCallum first. A quick thought from you and McCallum. McCallum did what I thought he would do. Carl Jones just wasn't what he intended to be, and that is championship caliber. He tried hard, but he didn't have the stuff. Second fight, just amazing. An amazing fight, and it ends up with Nigel Benn scoring the 10th round knockout. Thanks very much, Bobby. We've seen two world championship bouts featuring three fighters you've seen before on Showtime. The fighter who has appeared most often in this network is five-time world champion Julio Cesar Chavez. Now Julio's greatest moments in the ring are available for fight fans to enjoy on video cassette. 92 professional fights, 77 knockouts, 5 world titles. Now, relive the glory, the fury, the awesome power of Julio Cesar Chavez's greatest fights. Available now for the first time on this exclusive video special from the best of Don King, Chavez the Legend. Call now, 1-800-77-JULIO. And for $19.95 plus $4.95 shipping and handling, you can relive the historic moments from Chavez Hagen, Chavez Camacho, Chavez Hernandez, plus many more. Call now with your credit card, and for only $19.95 plus $4.95 shipping and handling, you can receive the show of a lifetime. Julio Cesar Chavez, the legend. Hi, I'm Gloria, and our Ring Girl operators are waiting to take your calls. Credit cards only by phone, or send checks or money orders to Chavez the Legend. P.O. Box 2786, Van Nuys, California, 91404. Also available at selected Blockbuster locations. 
On April 8th, Julio Cesar Chavez returns to the ring to defend his WBC Super Lightweight title as part of the championship undercard to the McCall-Holmes WBC Heavyweight Championship bout. McCall and Holmes will be the main event of four world title fights presented by Showtime Event Television and King Vision. See it all April 8th, live on pay-per-view at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific Time. Showtime Championship Boxing resumes here on this network March 17th when WBA Cruiserweight Champion Orlin Norris defends his title against Adolfo Washington. Also featured that night from Boston is Julian Jackson, who fights for the vacant WBC Middleweight Championship, and hometown hero Peter McNeely, who fights in a 10-round heavyweight bout. Showtime Championship Boxing coming to you from Beantown on St. Patrick's Day, Friday, March 17th at 9.35 p.m. Eastern and Pacific Time. Time now for a quick recap of the night from London Arena. Mike McCallum made his first title defense of his WBC light heavyweight title a successful one as he easily snatched the victory away from Carl Jones by scoring a seventh round TKO. And then in a bizarre battle which lived up to its billing, Nigel Benn in front of the hometown crowd proved he's one of boxing's best as he repelled the challenge of Gerald McClellan to successfully defend his WBC super middleweight title for the seventh time. It was a draw up to the 10th round before Ben scored a 10th round knockout. McClellan has been taken to the hospital. Hopefully, he will be okay, and our prayers right now are with Gerald McClellan. We'd like to thank our crews, which worked on both sides of the Atlantic tonight, who helped make this special co-production possible. So for Steve Albert, Ferdy Pacheco, and Bobby Chez, I'm Bruce Beck, saying so long for this edition of Showtime Championship Boxing. The following is a special presentation of HBO Sports. Donna Turns was the first to do it. Sugar Ray Leonard was next. Roberto Duran was the most recent. And Pernell Whitaker hopes to be the fourth. To do what, you ask? To be only the fourth fighter in boxing history to have won titles in four different weight classes. For Pernell Whitaker, it began in 1989.